ήρθε να τραβλούν. So we beat on. Through to our annual appointment with the shipping world, we are happy to invite you to the fourth Fly to Open Shipping Finance 2021. Dear us all, welcome. Welcome to the Slide to Open Shipping Finance Conference 2021. For the next three days, we will be here together to share an exciting experience of this physical interactive conference. I have the great pleasure to welcome Mrs. Despina Travlou, the Managing Director of Slide to Open Communications and the organizer of this event. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for joining us, welcome. I would like to call and welcome also the conference chair, Mr. Angelos Lupas Pantaleon, who is the founder of Second Win and Partners. Vespera, thank you for including me in this year's Slide to Open Conference. It's my pleasure to be present with you, thank you. 2020 has been a difficult year, a year of unprecedented events. If you remember, in last year's Shipping Finance Conference, quite a few speakers were dropping hints and expressing concern on the course of COVID-19, yet none of us had imagined all that. And how proud the shipping industry would make us all with its indispensable uh, contribution this past year. Without shipping, we could not have survived. Definitely. And so, we are here today And may I say how happy I am to see so many of you joining us. We are here today to see where we are and what we can do next to adjust our course and head to the future to embrace new technology, develop our skills and grow. And make the voice of shipping be heard worldwide loud and clear. <laughs> Dear friends, I'm happy to welcome you to the Slide to Open Shipping Finance 2021. I would like to, th to thank the moderators who over these past months have always been doing their best, eagerly and tirelessly. Our speakers, all willing to share their know-how and expert views with us. Our sponsors for their invaluable support without which we wouldn't be here. But first and foremost, I would like to thank my colleagues and partners. We have a full schedule and th three exciting conference day ahead, days ahead of us. Your time is precious, so let's start right away. It's our honor and privilege to have with us the Minister of Maritime Affairs and Insular Policy, Mr. Yanis Plakotakis. Minister, the floor is yours. First of all, because of the high level of the speakers and their vast experience on our current position of this forum, it is exceptional, uh, though for another reason. It serves its role as a stakeholder platform, giving the opportunity to reveal key players' opinion or plans to the pandemic and the multiple impacts in the maritime sector. Let me start by pointing out the obvious. Policymakers should do what their position indicates, create the policy framework, and uh, at the same time formulate the mechanisms or political platform in a way that goals, indicators, funds, and instruments make sure. After almost 30 years of European Union cohesion policy or other centrally organized uh, initiatives, we must have learned our lesson on how to promote effective and results based on European Union or national policies. I will be very clear in my message today. The mobilizing of the recovery or further development of blue economy sectors will be achieved only if we create play-based approaches and integrated strategies. Maritime related sectors, crucial for European Union economy, and of course, uh, for many national economies of member states, create value in terms of income, labor, but they have clear territorial impact that we must not 
underestimate, such as maritime industry, ports, shipbuilding, and ship repair activities. The policy path for the recovery of the blue sectors is not different than before the pandemic. The policy uh, recommendations and instruments in the European Union, but also in the regional level, were already uh, well focused. The pandemic uh, has just revealed weakness of the governance system and several drawbacks related to the policy makers reactions to the market challenges. Some uh, uh, blue economy sectors have been proved to be quite resilient and uh, at the same time critical for our social, economic and territorial cohesion. For example, maritime transportation and ports were crucial parts of the supply chain for the European markets, especially during the first phase of the pandemic. Our mandate is now is to take stock of the valuable recommendation given from the European Union report on blue economy and build on the progress made bearing in mind the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic in all uh, the affected sectors. Especially the maritime nations of the Mediterranean have to impose strong political will based on the solid policy instruments and robust mechanism for the limitation of our international, European and uh, national commitments. The ministerial declaration on the sustainable of blue economy that was recently signed will acknowledge not only the future priorities of the sustainable blue economy, but we uh, emphasized in the common interest on domains that will bring all the MED countries under a new blue strategy that will, that uh, of course uh, will create value in terms of income, jobs, new jobs creation, common ground on protecting our vital marine and uh, submarine ecosystems. Together, we set high in our nation policy agenda, the vision for a more green and blue Mediterranean sea basin and we're committed to work closely towards a sustainable and integrated development of marine and maritime sectors. As you are all aware, of course, uh, Greece is a maritime nation with long tradition and strong connection with the sea in economic, social and environmental aspects. Almost uh, one fourth of our national GDP is produced by sectors related to blue economy and coastal tourism, and nearly one-fifth of our population lives in the islands. Therefore, we confirm our strong political will to reinforce our country's blue economy governance strategy. One month ago, just a few days before the signing of the declaration in Greece, we enacted a law for the integrated maritime policy for our insular territory, combining insular policy an integrated maritime policy under a new national strategy. Maritime economy, insularity, and sustainable blue growth is the policy triangle of our newly introduced framework. This European Union declaration that we signed on the 1st of February served as a political inspiration for our plan to formulate our legislative package by, first of all, designing national policy documentation on maritime strategy with specific priorities, tangible results and indicators for blue uh, economy policy fields, introducing three very specific financial instruments for promoting green public investment in uh, critical infrastructure and operation in the insular areas, promoting sustainability in maritime transport, through green public service contracts for the ferries and other related initiatives. Secondly, introducing the first Greek Maritime Blue Fund to support sustainable entrepreneurial business models for blue uh, economy sector SMEs, emphasizing in innovation and new technologies for sustainable blue investments. And finally, setting up the national registries for a maritime blue affairs stakeholder based on the quadruple helix model, promoting their engagement and productive networking. 
We are working very closely with the Ministry of Development and Investments, but also with intermediate bodies such as the Hellenic Development Bank and the deposits and loans funds that will assist us in the implementation of the newly introduced financial mechanism dedicated to green investment in ports, green public service contracts for passenger shipping, and maritime blue entrepreneurship. Let us not forget that uh, Greece remains a pillar of stability in the Mediterranean region and a global power in maritime domain firmly committed to our joint future under the European Union's core values and priorities. For all uh, the above reasons and remarks for the recent political initiatives that we took, allow me to be very optimistic about the opportunities that we can uh, create in a collaborative way for the uh, blue recovery. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your valuable contribution. <laughs> if I may, by way of a, of a short remark, just to a little bit uh, focus on the ownership side of shipping, which is so important globally and for the Greek economy. Many times we, we hear that uh, Greek ship owners have done so wonderfully well because they don't rely so much on the Greek state. And I do know and we do see that you're undertaking substantial initiatives now. How can we really give assurances to Greek ship owners that the state will be always on the side and what initiatives would you have in mind in this respect? It is true that shipping is in the blood uh, uh, of Greek people. Our maritime tradition goes back a uh, thousand of years, but certainly the Greek shipping miracle of modern times has thrived on the, uh, let's say, the entrepreneurial spirit of Greeks, their love uh, for the sea, and their business fair and flexibility. Having said that, uh, uh, the Greek state has recognized from the uh, beginning that its shipping industry constitutes uh, a national asset for the country and has developed as far as possible a non-interventionist framework uh, for it to operate in. After all, uh, the Greek uh, uh, shipping industry in its largest share is international and cross-trading, trading between uh, third countries. Therefore, uh, it is essential uh, carrying the trade of uh, uh, the world. However, uh, the Greek state cannot rely solely on a non-interventionist approach to help keep this uh, uh, a vital economic pillar competitive internationally. Today, uh, there are numerous shipping centers, both in the European Union and around the world, which offer uh, especially favorable business environments aiming to attract the location of shipping industries of other countries. Shipping is uh, highly mobile and can uh, therefore choose the most business-friendly jurisdiction for its operation. So uh, the Greek state must uh, ensure that it maintains uh, internationally competitive conditions for the establishment and continuation of shipping activities in the country, as well as, of course, an uh, internationally competitive ship uh, registry. But you asked me about uh, a more cooperative environment, and uh, uh, this is exactly what we are doing from the very first day uh, that, that I took power. We are rebuilding, actually, uh, the relationship of trust with other maritime community, with our, sorry, maritime community, by means of a set of favorable measures. Uh, we have just recently uh, proposed a new deal to our maritime community by introducing all uh, the necessary regulatory changes that were being considered as uh, disadvantages of the Greek flag and others that modernize our institutional uh, uh, regime, like, for example, very bought in and a renewed uh, taxation and maritime employment regime aiming to attract more ships in the Greek flag and young people to the maritime profession. Mr. Uh, ah, I feel uh, and I am very optimistic that our maritime community 
will react uh, really positively to our competitors oriented initiatives and we shall soon realize good results out of this effort then us, let us uh, thank you once again for co your contribution to close this on a very positive momentum that you have built with all your initiatives and to wish you to many more to come many more initiatives for the betterment of global shipping and greek shipping thank you so much thank you very much i would like to welcome now mr the, the imo ambassador in greece and president of the Eugenides Foundation, Mr. Leonidas Dimitriadis Eugenides. Dear Mrs. Travlos, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to welcome Slide to Open 2021 motto, So We Beat On. This is not just an inspiring phrase at the end of uh, Scott Fitzgerald's masterpiece, but reflects clearly Shipping's motto in action. There is no doubt that throughout human mankind history, come war, hell, high waters, catastrophes, pandemics, shipping was always there, adapted, versatile, determined, bringing together the brains of the sore and the dedication and brains of people on board in order for commodities to move and the world to confront all kinds of crises. There's no doubt that shipping maintained its key role as a healthy pillar of, for the world to continue, moving also during the pandemic 19. And of course, it's expected to continue in the same way. This did not happen automatically, as mentioned before. Core values, human factor, professionalism, adaptability, all that based on collaboration among all parties concerned, combining human factor and skills together with technology, which for the first time have shown its teeth, digitalization during the COVID-19 crisis, assisted to get through that tough and rough waters. If I made uh, the reference to the digital era, there is no doubt that cloud, internet, communications, uh, very important for the welfare of the crews because with that way we kept the crews communicating with their family and uh, with their countries. Something was unimaginable a few years ago, but also remote inspections, remote assistance, smart logistics. All that worked in, a, in an applicable way so the world could survive with the proper moving of commodities, energy, and name it, and all that thanks to shipping, which is moving 90% of the world trade. In all these good things which happen regarding shipping in contributing into the catastrophic pandemic confrontation, there was though something which is a very negative cloud. Despite the voice of owners, of unions, of seafarers, in a very loud and clear voice, world governments and the political systems, unfortunately, failed to a great extent to confront the issue of the repatriation of the crews. I don't want to repeat things which are quite known, but I honestly hope that this thing will be resolved together with the necessity of the urgent vaccination of the crews. It's so important, both from human side point of view, but also for the trade to move on. If things will continue, and it may continue, I'm an optimist, but things may go tough and rough for a substantial time, this is a must. At the same time, as I said before, one lesson we learned is that shipping is always there, adapted and versatile. The second thing was illustrated more than ever, how important is human factor together with technologies to work hand in hand in order to get a better result. So there is no doubt, to my point of view, turning the threat to an opportunity that uh, with proper R&D, proper education, and a good dialogue between stakeholders to set the parameters for a tomorrow of shipping in the world economy, which is based on our tradition, our experience, but also from the lessons we have learned. All that supported by proper R&D, dialogue, vision, and first, and last and not least, with proper impact studies. Not repeat the criminal mistakes of the past. So, uh, we are there, shipping will be there, 
And uh, I have no doubt that uh, Greece will always continue to contribute being, I wouldn't say on the helm because it's an arrogant expression, but at least to be one of the front runners uh, in shipping. But also I have a great belief in the Greek binds and brain. And I'm sure that our technical institutions as a part of the European family with a proper R&D, proper education system and enhanced maritime and marine education will be there to participate today in the shipping of tomorrow. So slide to open 2021, beat on and have a very successful and constructive event. Wish you all the best. Well, we would like to thank Mr. Dimitriadis Avionidis for placing shipping in its right context and giving us his overviews. And now please join us in watching a discussion that Mr. Dimitriadis Avionidis and I had. And uh, please uh, uh, let us uh, watch the remarks he shared with us. Thank you. Dear Leonida, good day. Thanks for joining Slide to Open for a brief exchange of ideas and opinions on this current situation this past year. Let's uh, beat on with the first theme, which has to do, of course, with the pandemic and shipping and how we believe shipping has weathered the storm. We seem to have been well fed, adequately clothed, We've been kept warm, and all this has happened because of shipping. What's your view on how shipping has fared, and, and what lessons do you believe we can learn from all this situation? Thank you for this very inclusive introduction. I think in a very concise way you put the fingers on the nail. I honestly believe that, uh, not surprisingly, because it is historically proven, shipping was there and is still there in order to facilitate the world economy and society to confront the crisis. The spectrum and the impact of the counter effects of pandemic COVID-19, I consider that this is one of the major things happening, the major during 21st century. And I hope it's the last one and it's not going to be we all, long we all enough do. to we stay, I hope so. <laughs> And here I recall uh, something which ex-U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld used to say. He used to say things we know we don't know. This is to say that a very grave thing happened. The world and the society were unprepared, and still I think we are prepared, unprepared, but shipping on other things being equal has proven that uh, was there, was very adaptive, was very versatile, and shipping contributed into the world, being fed, getting energy, commodities to move around. So the lesson, first lesson we, we have learned is that uh, let's get the lessons from an adaptive, I would say, industry, which is based on the core values. Core values have to do with human factors, both ashore and on board. The brains ashore, the hard work, tradition, perseverance, but nothing would have done without our crews. You raise exactly a very important point, the human factor. How it's, do you believe shipping 90 has... 90% is human factor. How do you believe shipping has tackled that particular segment? So that tackled very well. I would say there's no one negative uh, parameter here, and this is a lesson, a counter lesson. Uh, a lesson we, we haven't learned is that uh, it is, shipping is not the only case. We, if, if our planet suffers out of something, it's lack of a strong global governance. This is to say uh, stakeholders, political system, all parties involved and concerned to be in a situation to sit together and with a visionary way resolve issues. On the other hand, is it always possible to, to take the worst case scenario in mind and, and, and have governance only based on a worst case scenario? No, in other uh, words, I mean, were uh, we completely unprepared, you believe? Uh, of course, we were completely unprepared. Only 
uh, it was a question of movies that we were watching, and I don't think that everybody uh, did, did have it ever cross your mind that a thing like that may Ab happen. Absolutely not. Absolutely not to mind. But I want to repeat what Ransfeld said before: the things we know, we don't know. This is to say that you have to to have the knowledge, the understanding, the perseverance, the innovative approach, the willingness to understand a problem and resolve. Shipping is linked to crisis management, resolving issues. Troubleshooting. Assault, troubleshooting. Exactly. So uh, without big words, I don't believe in excessive regulation, but I, I believe in practical way and visionary ways to intelligently find quick and expedient solutions. On that, we need to, to go a bit uh, stronger and... Uh, Educate our future politicians. Exactly. Well, I don't say I'm, I, I'm too... <laughs> it's, you know, it's, I'm not a politician, so I, I declare ignorance on that. But definitely because politicians, they're part also of ourselves. I mean, they're mirroring what we are. So it's a matter of education for all concerned. But uh, what's really required is that we take a step back and we look uh, how to resolve problems about the seafarers. Because as I mentioned in uh, the welcome, it's a big issue that we cannot repatriate uh, the crews. So we cannot exchange the crews. And this is very bad for uh, the performance and uh, from a human factor. And also, it's very important, the question of the experience of vaccination, because they are the soft and hard skills required for the trade. The other lesson we learn is that uh, digitalization is there. Mm. I think, uh, to put things in the right perspective, from small practical things, I mean, the, the cost of the internet and the means and the speed and the quality of the image gave the possibility for the crews in particular to be closer to their beloved ones and their families. So it didn't solve, but definitely, uh, I'm 63 years of age, these things would have been unimaginable. I'm, I'm someone who was a sailor of the sea, of the, of, of the land. I was traveling. So I understand what communication means and so how do, important it Do was. you believe that those shipping companies that had had a, a head start on technology and digitization uh, weathered the storm better and were able to support their crews I, I in a more effective way? I think that there was... Way? Right. I think there was a democratization in the sense that um, it's not only that is the question because everybody, practically all the companies have the digital equipment. So all the crews practically cannot imagine a ship, uh, an ordinary ship without being equipped with all this uh, important and uh, affordable equipment uh, in all different kinds of ships. The second thing, uh, which is uh, quite important, is that uh, we had also the digital inspections, the digital inspections of the surveyors and classification societies, how work with the owners. I mean, that was applicable for all concerned. It was not only for the high level Flag states companies. issuing certificates electronically. Hey, also okay, all, all that, and still there are more things to be done. There are things which are not yet to a 100% satisfactory level, but we're in a, in a track, which is a very good one. And uh, it advanced quite a lot and has proven itself during the crisis. And then, last and not least, and then, of course, it was very important for the smart logistics. Because uh, when we come to the distribution, and shipping is a part of logistics, to the end-to-end -end, uh, distribution, I mean, uh, digitalization was so important from the point of view of efficiency for the vast system of delivery, the vast pressure on the system on delivery, because a lot of physical things that will be substituted by other methods. So these things are coming. And last and not least, I think it's very important uh, how strong digitalization entered the education. Exactly. Because uh, it is so important that, uh, for instance, take uh, the Greek uh, Merchant Marine Academies, that we have something that was so difficult to even to think and imagine, we have distance learning. It's not perfect yet, but it's there. So uh, we function, so students can follow their courses. So this is, was very important, but digitalization, but it's also more important than ever to understand, as I said before, the question of skills. Because if we survived, it is the adaptability, the soft and the hard skills who make the difference. The human element the makes human the element. difference. All the others are elements who assist. They are not substituting. It's a part of the equation. And if we look today at backlogs in various ports and in the throughput of the goods, it's the lack of the human element because many people are falling ill uh, or can't cope with the pressure. It's the lack of the human element that's causing the backlogs nowadays Absolutely. in many ports. So it's, it's, it's very important to mention and keep focused on that. And I'm very proud that uh, Greek shipping is following very closely through our 
union or union GUGS, a union of Greek Seaponian Association, who are very much in the front line of uh, preserving our tradition, uh, whereas at the same time support uh, the concept of preparing ourselves for the future. And don't forget that we have uh, the sustainable goals of uh, IMO, the 17 targets. Uh, it's the environment, there are so many things on which shipping is and will continue to be the front line. Though, uh, all what we do, it has to be done in a way that is done proper and holistic, with proper impact studies. Gathering of data, communication, efficiency and cost vastly ameliorated. The question today is the multi-level administration of the data, where all concerns have to be very careful, avoiding inefficiencies and then R&D driven by other parameters and supported by impact studies. More collaboration is required by all industry stakeholders, particularly in the field of access, security and data ownership, in order to identify and agree on the vision of the bigger picture, because what we require is to have the big picture, not vocal vested interest to tackle for their own benefit with institutions and projects supported by European Union bits and pieces. A cooperative approach. Exactly, which, uh, which will drive, drive to a sub-solution situation, but it will be sub-solutions without giving a proper solution. So, in effect, you should have digitalization for the, benefit of the, for the benefit of the industry, not the industry for the benefit of the digitalization. And therefore, COVID-19 was an accelerating and is an accelerating factor of how shipping can benefit from digitalization, not the other way around. I think your ideas today have placed nice seeds for the discussions to follow during the slide to open conference. So thank you very much for your contribution. And we look forward to other speakers much. to express their okay. views. Thank you. Thank you. The conference has started in such a profound way. So we beat on. I have now the great pleasure to present you Dr. Sadan Kaptanoglu, the president and chairperson of the board of BIMCO, on an interview conducted by Ms. Katerina Stathopoulou, the executive director of investments and finance and governor of International Propeller Club, Port of Piraeus. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In today's session, Spotlight on Industry Makers, I have the distinct honor and pleasure to welcome Mrs. Adan Kaptanoglu, President and Chairperson of the Board of BIMCO. Sadan, welcome. Nice to have you. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Let, allow me to begin by stating that the issue of crew changes and repatriation has become the number one problem during and sparked by COVID, along with the IMO greenhouse gas reduction measures. Now, I am aware that you and your president designate, Mrs. Adam, uh, Mrs. Excuse me, Mrs. Sabrina Chao, attended the World Ocean Summit and a World Economic Forum meeting a few days ago addressing and discussing these issues. Can you please share with us the outcome of these discussions and BIMCO's actions on these issues? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I mean, good evening. And it is so difficult now to actually salute people. I think it is much better if I just say hello to everybody. Correct. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. And um, so we all know that we are going through difficult times. And pandemic has uh, changed our lives dramatically, I have to say. Uh, but let me start by saying that shipping did a great job. I think we proved what the ship owners were saying uh, all the time, that, you know, without us, the world stops. And the world didn't stop. And, but all this performance come with a cost. And that is our seafarers. From the early days of the pandemic, we worked so hard, all together with the all shipping associations. Uh, because the situation was, um, is in a way, 
puzzled us as well, I have to admit, because uh, what we think was a perfect supply chain, we learned that it wasn't at all. So, you know, there is a lot of things to be lessons to be taken out from the uh, pandemic. And one of them is now uh, that our great uh, supply chain and our great shipping industry whole operation is not resilient. So we have to work on it. So we start right away. Uh, I think the, there are certain, maybe just a little good outcomes of this, you know, pandemic that one of them is collaboration. So we are collaborating more than ever. All together, we are working on this. Uh, and while we are working at the IMO level, all together, you know, and I want to thank all my fellow shipping association members that, you know, we work so hard to improve the crew change. Uh, well, we, it is better than it used to be. Is it enough? Certainly not. So we still, you know, keep on working. And of course, as associations, we have other things we do on the side which is, for example, for BIMCO, we immediately produced a, a COVID-19 clause for crew change. Uh, well, it is, you know, it is adapting slowly, and I think uh, charters has been in their own market for a long time, so they are, it is taking time to, you know, adjust, but uh, it is coming along, and uh, because this is beyond, you know, I, I don't want to say shipping, but this is beyond the ship owner or the ship operators or only charters matter. This is an ethical matter that we all have to address together. Uh, so we are, you know, continuing to work on the situation. And also now we are also working on the vaccination uh, situation. And we, you know, that's why we always say that, you know, every... Uh, member states of the IMO should accept seafarers as a key workers and uh, so that, you know, they can be also have a, a better advantage for when it comes to vaccination. So this is one of the things that we are also working as well. Uh, so there are a lot of things to be learned from the pandemic and I think pandemic also act as an accelerator. And uh, so it speed up the thing. So our greatest challenge is uh, is the decarbonization of shipping. And I think this pandemic makes people think about the environment because, you know, we keep on talking, but I think now we all have to do the work as well. Not only shipping, but every individual, you know, people in the world because climate change should be stopped. We are not the first generation, maybe, to actually pollute our wonderful country, uh, or, which is Earth, <laughs> to me. Uh, but we can be the last one to save it. So we have to be very careful. So decarbonization shipping is also, you know, we see the acceleration. And this is not a bad thing. This, this is, you know, will increase the awareness, the commitment for uh, not only shipping industry, but also the outsiders as well. And uh, now last November, we have the IMO meeting and now we have the short-term measures. And uh, which in BIMCO, we are working on it uh, because we want a practical and global short-term measures. This is very important. And uh, also, we are still working on our research and development fund, which is also, I think, important because there is a lot of innovations. There is a lot of investment on innovation. Well, we know that, but we do not know all of them. So decarbonization requires more than one solution. So I think a research fund should actually gather all this innovation so we can look and you know identify and also maybe can create awareness that the some of the technologies that we don't know so i you know we still i think that it is very important and we are also you know working on to acceptance of the research uh, and development fund uh, having said that you know while we are doing all this effort for our environment and we know that our timeline is very short uh, so and we have to be stick on that timeline. So also in BIMCO, we think it is now time to discuss about market-based measures. 
So we invite all the member states of the IMO to open a dialogue and start to discuss uh, about the market-based measures. Why this is important? Because this is about being a proactive now. You know, with the short-term measures, hopefully with the research fund, we will have the time for the readiness. And when the technology is ready, the global, and I underline this word, the global uh, MBM should be available to the you know, ship owners, just to keep the level playing field as well. And all these efforts, me being in the uh, economist and Sabrina is being also, you know, in the uh, independent uh, uh, panel is because we want to get things out of our comfort zone. That is also one thing we learned in the uh, pandemic. We know each other, shipping people, shipping administrations, flag state, we, we, we have no problem there. But the moment we are out, Ministry of Health, Ministry of you know, Domestic uh, Affairs, then nobody knows about us. So we have to be able to you know, go out there and talk to people and tell them who we are, who we really are. So I, that is one of the, you know, uh, effort we are making. Uh, and we will keep on being advocate of, of shipping. Thank you. Well, um, you used wonderful word, words like collaboration. And what I am taking out of what you just discussed is that one of the things that has happened due to COVID is that shipping is starting to become extrovert. And I like the idea of making the world know who we are and how do we operate. And all of the associations like BIMCO and IMO are spearheading this. And this really makes me proud to be a shipping person, um, as I've always Thank been, you. but even more prouder. Mm -hmm. So it takes a crisis to get us out of our comfort zone and change things. And uh, thank you for that, for spearheading it as BIMCO. Now, very shortly, I would like to touch upon maritime security and Nigerian piracy. How is BIMCO addressing these issues? Uh, well, uh, I, I still hard to believe this is my biggest difficulty. We are in 21st century and there is piracy not like the ones in the movies, you know, actual real piracy. And, and this is happening on 21st century on commercial vessels. So from a BIMCO perspective, this is not acceptable anywhere. And Gulf of Guinea and Nigeria, we have a problem. Of course, Nigerian government uh, and Nigeria as a country, they are trying to do their best and taking precautions. But so far, this is not enough. The situation is accelerating. Now they start to shoot people. Wow. So we we have to, uh, in a way, in BIMCO, we think that enough is enough. So what does that mean? That means that now we uh, outspokenly, as you see, uh, asking a collaboration between uh, the country's territorial forces and the international forces. So we, because we have a success story in the Gulf of Aden, and and you know Gulf of Guinea is a very small place. We do not yes. need that much, you know, investment. It's a very small place. So together with you know international uh, forces, and if we can mix that with the Nigerian territorial forces, that I think we can make make it. Yes, enough is really enough, and uh, I'm sure that uh, when everybody collaborates, has open dialogue, as we said, uh, solutions will be found. One very quick last point, as our time is running out, is I know you touched upon what have we learned from COVID, and you're also working on it, but I know BIMCO has done a very uh, bold move in the extrovert um, category, and I would like you to tell us about it. Um, yeah, now the, the century we are living is all about reaching the individual people. So we thought that, you know, a movie, a very short movie about, the, you know, our seafarers, our shipping, 
and what we really do and why what we are doing is matter will be a, a good uh, way of you know starting to tackle with the perception of shipping and so we make this hero movie uh, ships make the world go and we've been getting great uh, response and also I, we are you know we did this for outside we also get great uh, words from the inside which also uh, tell me that we are on the right track because I think now the ship owners, we have wonderful generation of ship owners everywhere in the world. So we have to step up and talk about what we do and why we do it, because it is not certainly all about making money. True. So uh, thank you. We are um, looking forward. I think this has already been uh, put live on uh, YouTube, is it? Or um, through your uh, website? Has this been launched? Because I've seen a video um, that says the world uh, shipping makes the world go round. Yes, indeed, it is. It's been launched uh, as a kind of a, a, a New Year a New Year gift to. So we to should all be industry. sharing it, is what I yes, would like to please. say. We please. should all be sharing it. We should all be sharing it and uh, promoting uh, collaboration, open dialogue, in order to find all these solutions and uh, move forward in the 22nd to the 22nd century going forward now. Yes. So thank you, Sadan. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have just heard uh, the, um, <clears throat> the leaders and the industry makers' uh, views and their efforts. And I believe we should join them in their efforts to go forward and find all of these solutions. Thank you, Sadan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. After such an interesting discussion, I welcome you to listen together to the views of Mr. Alex Shipman, the Manager Director of Bremer Nevis Corporate Finance, on an interview conducted by the CEO of Slide to Open Communications, Mrs. Despina Travelu. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We have here with us today Mr. Axel Sipman, the D managing director of Bremer Navis and founder of Navis Corporation. Uh, Axel, thank you for joining us. Uh, since when has Bremer Navis been active in Greece? Um, we actually started becoming active in the year of our foundation in 2009 advising a Greek ship owner on a very large charter hire restructuring for a fleet of VLCCs. What type of mandates have you concluded for Greek uh, clients? Well, um, over the years, we've been especially active, you know, during the depths of the crisis in restructuring work. So we're, we're proud to say that we've successfully advised three uh, US listed um, Greek driven, Greek owned um, listed uh, companies. But next to restructuring over the years, we've also helped a lot of Greek ship owners to basically unwind financings with uh, German lenders, buying back their own lo loans, uh, raising financing on the debt and on the equity side, uh, and including actually also helping Greek owners to, to, to get new building projects financed. Oh, so what are the differences between Greek and other international clients? Well, as you're all aware, I mean, the, the particular thing in, in Greek is the family business uh, with the peculiar structures that are not necessarily corporate structures um, that create a little bit of a unique financing framework that is well known to the Greek banks, uh, but to some foreign institution, you know, they, they occasionally struggle and uh, it needs a little bit of uh, mediation, adjusting helping to get financing projects done at most competitive rates. What is your future strategy for the Greek market? Well, I mean, we've been traveling for so many years to Greece that uh, last year we actually decided that we'll start our own office alongside our shipbroking team. Uh, the office is in, in Glifada. 
uh, that will take us uh, closer to, to, to our Greek clients. Um, and in, in terms of product, I would anticipate that will help especially uh, Greek ship owners to get new building project finance that meet the future um, environmental um, restrictions, the future environmental framework. Okay, interesting. Do you see consolidation in the industry? That is a question we're frequently asked and my answer is yes and no. Uh, it's yes because no doubt we see consolidation and uh, in certain areas it, it makes perfect sense um, to, to, to create businesses that have a certain firepower, a certain strength, but that doesn't mean, and this is why I also say no, that family owned businesses will not um, stay there for the next, you know, for the foreseeable future because they're very successful, they do business differently. And I don't see any need that, that any small business necessarily has to consolidate. I think it, it depends very much on in which segment you are, what your strategy is, and what your financing capabilities are. If you're fully equity finance, you know, you can own one ship and have a decent life. Okay. What do you regard as the financing challenges that the Greek shipping industry will face in the years to come? Well, that takes me back to the question that you asked, you know, why are we moving to Greece? And indeed, I think one of the challenges will be that environmental regulation in combination with financial regulation could force more and more Greek owners to form corporate structures if they, if they want to grow. Um, if they decide to stay limited in size, you know, it, it's always possible to finance one or two ships. But if you look at large fleets, and if you think ahead, the, 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 in the next few years, we might see a, you know, a very, very strong fleet renewal program. And for that size, we'll have, uh, and, and, and the way how you do structure your business will play an important role. And I think that is one of the challenges because some of the family uh, old businesses might consider to nevertheless address their structures a little bit as to, to tap into those opportunities. Okay, thank you, Axel. That was brilliant. Thank you very much for joining us. Despina, thank you very much and we'll have a good conference. Italy soon in Athens. Well, uh, no doubt when the lockdown's over, you know, one of the first trips will be to Athens and Piraeus. It was a great pleasure. Me too. Hope to see you there. Yeah, see you. See you. Take care. Bye. Bye. I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Kostandinos Kanelopoulos, who is uh, responsible for the business development in Greece of Bremer Naves Corporate Finance. Uh, and he is the moderator of our first panel discussion on Greek shipping strategies. Mr. Kanelopoulos. Dennis, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Today's shipping industry is faced with a rapidly changing environment caused primarily by increasingly impactful regulations on the environmental financing as well as operational side of things. Although the long-term objectives of such regulations is to increase transparency, decrease harmful emissions, and in overall enhance, enhance efficiency in the sector, short-term effects include higher operating as well as financing costs, as well as potential bottlenecks in shipyards for new building orders. In these adverse conditions, ship owners are called upon to plan and execute their strategies in order to capture potential opportunities and mitigate foreseeable risks. Today, we are delighted to have with us the representatives of two distinct Greek ship owning companies who will share with us their strategies. Without further ado, let me introduce our guests. Today, we have with us Mr. Haris Kosmatos who is the Business Development Officer at Tacos Energy Navigation, and Alexis Stefanou, who is the Chief Financial Officer at Golden Port Group. How are you, gentlemen? Welcome. Uh, delighted to have, you, to have you with us today. So to start from the public side, Harry, uh, as a representative of a large Greek publicly listed shipping company, what is your outlook on the sectors that TEN is engaged in? And subsequently, what are your strategies going forward?
position the company to, uh, to, to tap the market. Uh, on the new building front, uh, as you know, the company has been very active. Actually, the, uh, uh, the fleet of 10 has today uh, almost exclusively has been built uh, for our own account. We haven't really processed it in the second hand market. Uh, so uh, we are looking forward to, uh, uh, you know, once an opportunity arises to, to build vessels uh, against long-term contracts. Uh, we will not build on speculation. We have uh, adopted uh, a more industrialized approach uh, when it comes to, to uh, time charter, uh, uh, time charter policy. Uh, so we are only seeking uh, to do transactions with uh, the blue chip oil majors for longer for the longer run, like for five plus years, to the extent that they are there. Today we don't see uh, uh, such uh, lengthy time charters being available. Uh, but uh, we believe once uh, the charters uh, see what we see, and I'm sure they, they see it before we do, uh, uh, they will start offering uh, longer term contracts before the market really takes, uh, uh, takes over. Uh, so overall, you know, we feel we are in a good position. And besides our bread and butter, which is uh, uh, crude tankers and, and, uh, and uh, uh, well, primarily crude and uh, uh, a component of product tankers, uh, we would like to expand or deepen our footprint, if you like, in the more specialized sectors, which in a way distinguish, differentiates uh, 10 uh, from the peer group, and that is LNG and shuttle tankers. Uh, we are, uh, as we speak, have uh, one building, one new building on each uh, of these uh, categories uh, that, uh, that we will take delivery by the end of the year, early next year. Uh, so, uh, uh, Looking ahead, we would like to uh, uh, to use some of the cash that the company will uh, uh, will generate in, uh, to to uh, to investment to to invest in those parallel uh, uh, sectors uh, uh, and uh, and uh, hopefully expand from there uh, and uh, as I say, you know, deepen our footprint. And, and uh, we will never become a shuttle tanker company or uh, an LNG company exclusively, but uh, we feel uh, at some point. And assuming uh, uh, we get an accretive uh, employment and uh, and uh, competitive financing, uh, we would like to probably double our presence in, uh, in uh, those specific sectors. Okay, thank you, Harry, for the very elaborative presentation. So during your talk, you mentioned the industrialization of the tanker segment, yeah. as I understand. 
And given the fact that you're a publicly listed company, which thus gives you the ability to access a wider variety of financing sources, do you think, first of all, first question is basically, do you think the industrialization of the sector will continue in the future and uh, will, come, will become more and more important? And if that is so, then how do you intend or do you intend to change the way you finance your projects? So do you intend to use more public market instruments or how do you see that evolving? From your side, uh, it, depends how you, uh, how you, uh, it, it depends on how you want to go and, uh, and uh, the areas you want to cut. Uh, I think that if we are looking uh, for uh, public funding in one way or another uh, through the common stock, uh, more structured deals, uh, joint ventures, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, and everything in between uh, with. You know, uh, private equity investors and uh, and the like. Then a company would probably need to shift towards uh, the industrial uh, uh, side of the business uh, because the in, in the, the the nature of these investors, they are not taking the uh, uh, the equity list. Today. They are not taking the market list. If you like, uh, so uh, they would rather uh, sacrifice some of the upside. Uh, or the volatility in the market and uh, and uh, uh, safeguard and secure an annuity-like return in the high single digits, low double digits uh, kind of area, okay. and make sure and uh, uh, that you know uh, come you know uh, through thick and thin they will get that return. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't see too much appetite from uh, uh, the retail sector. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, you know other investors to, to invest directly uh, either on, uh, on on the asset or, or the common equity of, of, of the company. Again, for, for, for the exact same reason that uh, you know they've been uh, been there, done that. A few of them have uh, mm -hmm. joined their fingers, so they would rather uh, uh, and go into a more secured uh, project. That's why we have seen over the last few months okay. uh, a more credit-oriented funds investing into shipping rather. Uh, you know, common stock holders, retail uh, holders that play the volatility in the market. Understood. Except thank you, Harry. Thank you, thank you. So, Alexis, uh, as the CFO of Goldenport, you're in the unique position to have a view on all three main segments of shipping. So, the dry bulk market, tankers, as well as container ships. So, given your unique position and the fact that you're still a, a private Greek shipping company, what is your, your view? Or your outlook on those three segments, and how do you intend to change your strategy if you intend to do so? Or otherwise, what is your strategy going forward? Well, uh, many thanks, uh, Constantine, and uh, to Vespina for the invitation to join this uh, panel. Uh, as you are aware, uh, Golden Book Group uh, controls a diversified fleet, it comprises about 40 vessels, comprising dry bulk carriers, container ships, and tankers. So uh, we believe that uh, uh, diversification uh, is, uh, you know, a key pillar of a strategy, um, and it is a critical success factor to survive and prosper in uh, what is a cyclical, highly cyclical shipping sector, um, in which uh, the different segments help to move in uh, the same direction. So, uh, just to give an example, you know, back in 2016 when the dry bulk market hit an all-time low, the tanker market was uh, was healthy. And uh, then last year when COVID struck, container ships and uh, dry bulk carriers uh, took a hit, uh, but tankers were experiencing sky-high rates as a result of the demand for floating storage that was triggered by the collapse in the oil price. Now, as Harris also mentioned, uh, you know, tankers have been weak uh, recently, uh, obviously the unwinding of the loading storage and the inventory is stocking, but uh, container ships and uh, dry bulk carriers on the other hand have exhibited very strong performance. So there is this element of uh, uh, diversification that we believe is, uh, is beneficial uh, to the performance of our group and it does give us uh, insight into the uh, relative merits of investing in, the, in those different segments. When one segment is strong uh, and another is weak, we can reallocate capital from the former to the latter mm -hmm. and take advantage basically of uh, acquisition opportunities. Now, uh, looking ahead, we do believe that, uh, you know, dry bulk carriers have at least two, three years of positive outlook 
underpinned by the global infrastructure spending and uh, the limited uh, order book. Container ships that have been the star performers over the last uh, few months, they're bound to revert to uh, you know lower but uh, still healthy levels as uh, vaccinations increase, our life returns to a, a certain normality and the consumers shift their spending from goods back to uh, experiences, travel and so on. And tankers, we expect to gradually revert to normal market conditions as the inventory the stocking cycle ends and COVID recedes. We expect an explosion in demand for travel. So towards the end of the year, uh, we expect uh, that uh, all three segments in which we are active in could be generating pretty attractive cash flows. So uh, diversification, we feel, is, a, is an important pillar of our strategy. Perhaps if I touch on uh, uh, another one, which is a, in a way similar to uh, what TEN is doing, is uh, you know partnerships with cargo interests. We also uh, like those because they de-risk our investments and they allow us to generate economies of scale. So these partnerships may involve a long-term charter and be of a more of a trading nature, or they may also involve an equity investment. Um, potentially, they could also involve uh, contracting uh, new building vessels uh, that would be in compliance with uh, uh, upcoming regulations, but always for a specific cargo need. Um, now, uh, just to touch, uh, you know, to mention that there, there is an emerging threat to this sort of type of strategy, which is that we have been seeing uh, uh, charters securing also operating leases from a leasing house, and then they outsource basically the technical uh, management to a third party and in a way, you know, cut out the, the ship owners. But we do believe that uh, nurturing long-standing relationships uh, with uh, charters and contributing capital to uh, joint ventures and therefore, uh, having skin in the game, I think uh, that offers better alignment uh, of interest with our, with our customers. Thank you, Alexis. Very interesting from the side of Goldenport. Now, for the second part of our discussion, I would like us to shift focus on a more macro view and speak a bit more generally about the Greek shipping industry. So, the main thing I would like us to discuss and for you two to um, express your opinion uh, if possible, is how do you see Greek shipping specifically changing in the future? What I mean by that is essentially that the profile of the average Greek ship owner is that of a smaller shipping company, below 10 vessels probably, which of course doesn't allow for large economies of scale. And also during the last five to 10 years, we see increasing financing costs for such companies. So from your point of view, how do you see the profile of the Greek ship owner changing and do you think it will affect the power of Greek ship owners globally overall? Um, whoever you would like to start. Harry, if you want to go first, since you were the first one in the last question. Well, uh, Greek shipping uh, was and will uh, remain, uh, uh, I think, the most prominent force in, uh, in, uh, in the maritime industry. Uh, irrespective of uh, regulations, irrespective of uh, ever-changing, uh, uh, you know, technical issues, uh, uh, the Greeks have uh, have proved that uh, they can always adapt to a certain one uh, degree or another. But th they can adapt. Uh, today, as we speak, I think there are more than 800, 900 shipping companies in Greece. The majority of them, uh, small, you know, family-owned, one, two, five vessels, under ten vessel uh, kind of companies. Uh, which, uh, you know, uh, as some of them uh, have very low debt, uh, all the vessels, uh, they have probably repaid uh, their loans. Uh, I think that uh, for the foreseeable future, they will continue operating. They will not necessarily compete for the, you know, action contracts or, you know, the Equino contracts, uh, but they will always be out there in the spot market doing their, uh, you know, their, their trades. And uh, uh, eventually, the companies that uh, have aspirations to do something bigger, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to grow, uh, to grow big, and to go into different areas uh, than their common comfort zone, then they will have to adapt, uh, and they will have to adopt new measures and new uh, and new ways uh, in uh, in uh, uh, in handling, uh, you know, the financing aspect of, of the operation. They might need to, to go out and uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, seek private equity money, do joint ventures, 
which by default will require them to change, uh, if you like, the uh, way they've been used to uh, in, in operating investment. Uh, as I have said frequently, you will only do that because you have a strategic idea, a strategic plan in uh, in uh, in in how to grow your business, and and you want to go from point A to point B uh, through uh, a measured way. You're not doing it because it's fashionable. You shouldn't be doing it because you want to go to New York and raise money and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 brag to your peers of you know you're a public company. Because the moment uh, uh, you fall into that trap, the company's going to go bankrupt. So it's very important. Uh, to, to, to be very specific on your growth plans. And, and I think we have, other than the big shipping companies, uh, there is uh, 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 a good number of uh, you know, medium-sized companies uh, out there ready to, to go into the next level. And I think over the years, these companies will uh, uh, kind of accelerate their, their, their development. But uh, all in all, uh, I think in terms of numbers, in terms of volume, big shipping will, uh, will remain a dominant power. And as uh, Axel uh, uh, very poignantly said in uh, in uh, in the interview before us, uh, even with one vessel, you can have a very decent line. So not every ship owner has the same ambitions. Uh, uh, for the majority of ship owners, one, two, three vessels would be you know more than enough. Uh, and, and this is how it will remain. And I, and I don't think you know shipping with the new technology and propulsion. Uh, the issues and aspects that, uh, that everyone is talking about, uh, be it LNG power, hydrogen power, and, uh, uh, and, and what else in between, <coughs> it, it will not happen overnight. Uh, so over the next, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, 10 years, to 15 years, uh, I don't see any spectacular changes, uh, uh, just uh, you know, fine tunings, but perhaps uh, more dominant uh, in, in uh, uh, the mid-sized companies that they want to go uh, elsewhere, they want to go one level up uh, from uh, from where they are. Okay. So thank you, Hardy. So thank you, no, thank you very much. So Alexis, from your your perspective, uh, do you have more or less the same view? So do you see, as I understand, that Hardy does the Greek ship owner uh, retaining its strength basically uh, through those adverse conditions that we're living in right now and even becoming stronger, stronger in the future? Well, it is certainly the case that uh, Greek shipping is made up of uh, you know, small uh, uh, family-owned companies that are predominantly active in the drawback sector and the operating environment is becoming increasingly challenging. So shipping generally is a, a textbook example of, uh, you know, perfect competition, a perfect competition industry where abnormal profits do not exist and uh, you know, only the fittest can survive in the long run. So uh, there, there, there seems to be a, a, a bias for you know, the, those that are able to uh, you know, uh, deliver on, uh, um, uh, on a low cost uh, basis and uh, you know, maintain quality and uh, size often helps in that respect. Financing conditions, uh, you're right, uh, you know, are becoming more onerous. Also, that we have the cost of the regulatory compliance. I think we have referred to that as well, that is increasing. And larger companies tend to have, uh, you know, the benefit of uh, economies of scale. And they can also pursue some of the strategies that we referred to before, like, you know, diversification and uh, partnerships with cargo interests. But some, you know, these tools are often not available to uh, the smaller companies. And uh, just to uh, link to uh, Harris's comment uh, about, you know, and Axel as well on consolidation, uh, it is also hard to implement because principals tend to prefer to be captains of their own ship, as uh, to, to, to use the, uh, the, the industry analogy. So uh, perhaps an alternative option uh, for, uh, for, for sm smaller uh, companies that could achieve some of the benefits of consolidation would be uh, to outsource certain functions. We have also discussed this, uh, Constantine, at some point in the past. So perhaps, uh, you know, this way, smaller companies could benefit from technological advances and achieve lower operating costs, thereby remaining competitive versus the larger peers. However, uh, even such uh, uh, a shift would basically uh, require uh, a change from, uh, you know, the current mantra, which is that, uh, uh, generally, we, we like to do everything in-house, mm -hmm. so um, 
that is uh, uh, there is a change in, in, in culture that would be involved in, in making this type of uh, moves. Okay, thank you, Alexis. Thank you both, gentlemen. Great to have two representatives of such large Greek shipping corporations have such a positive outlook on the future of shipping. At this point, I would like to thank all our guests uh, which are attending this afternoon. And again, thank our, uh, our two guests, Harry and Alexis. Thank you all for being here and look forward to continuing our interesting discussion next year. Thank you. Good afternoon once again. Thanks for joining for this next session. Greek shipping, whether small, medium, or large in size, has a few common threads most of the times. One element is the traditional nature of it. It frequently moves on from generation to generation. And the other element is the micromanagement, the successful micromanagement, which guarantees the efficiencies and the growth we see in Greek shipping. Please join us for a discussion with Nicolas Papalios, the energy behind Vantage Shipping Lines, and let us see what he has to share from his perspective being a traditional Greek shipping company. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Nicholas. Thanks for joining Slide to Open. My pleasure. For a, a brief discussion on certain relevant uh, shipping matters, which we would like to bring out to the open for people to hear your views on. We meet today when there seems to be a turn of fortunes for certain segments of the shipping industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, this brings with it a certain euphoria. And maybe if the pandemic, the end of the pandemic is in sight, maybe better days uh, or even better days are in sight. And so that begs the question, at least in my view, as to the prevailing sentiment that one hears when the markets are not good, that the small and medium size market will not survive and therefore there'll be consolidation and small owners will not be able to rebuild their fortunes. Uh, yet we've seen that the numbers of small and medium-sized owners have pretty much remained consistent. So I, I, I would like to have your views on why you believe this is the case mm -hmm. and uh, what it is that this uh, segment, this backbone of Greek shipping mm -hmm. brings uh, to the table that is so vital and so important. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, this is a very interesting question indeed. Uh, this is a debate that has been discussed for many years, whether a big company can compete to a smaller company. The major benefit of a big company has to, obviously has to do with the economies of scale and with the fact that they can, uh, on every operational aspect, they can minimize the expenses because of the volume. And this is indeed a very um, important aspect. Nonetheless, a, a medium-sized company, which is o operated on a day-to-day -day basis on an on the daily matters from the ship owner himself, uh, can benefit and can be very um, competitive because of the quick decision-making, as well as the involvement, the personal involvement of the ship owner on the day-to-day -day matters. And this gives the flexibility to smaller traders um, that they do not have the expertise that is required uh, to, 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 to enjoy the support of a bespoke, so to say, service from the ship owners for all their commercial needs. To give you an example, uh, a small a size company which probably is dealing with smaller sizes vessels needs to call uh, smaller ports with smaller traders that they have different local regulations and complications with receivers and shippers. And then all of a sudden, the ship owner, instead of being just a carrier, he's being a cargo coordinator. 
and uh, and this is something that uh, that is a, that, that, that is definitely um, an added value a, a plus for a plus and i think that has a lot to do with the fact that more hands on more more hands on and uh, and and the expertise that you cannot you cannot find in a big corporate structure where there are lots of bods and the decision making needs to go through layers of command rather than uh, uh, what is happening in a more flexible uh, small scheme. And, and, and many times, if I may add, if, if you agree, you, uh, younger generations moving uh, along the years grow into these positions through what they see mm -hmm. and what they sense and mm -hmm. what they experience sometimes over the years. And so therefore, when, when you get to the helm, you have really seen it all and, and experienced it all rather than having been a, a professional manager. Correct, yes, yes. This is, yeah, well, this is the traditional shipping compared to a corporate, uh, the, the, this, this has not, nothing to do with the size of the company, it has to do with the structure of the company. And the layers, the decision-making layers. Making yes, layers. Yes. So I, I, I suspect you would, you would view this as, as the main strength of the small to medium-sized company. To tie all this short discussion together, you are a by now a fifth generation uh, owner. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've been uh, bred into, into to, to this industry with all its positives, negatives, its trials, tribulations over mm -hmm. the years. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering now whether you think there are fundamental differences in the way your great-grandfather run the operation compared to the way you run it, meaning mm -hmm. technology has changed and regulations have changed, but has the fundament of what it takes to be a successful ship owner really changed in your view? I take pride of my, uh, of my family's Heritage. background. Heritage. Coming from the island of Hios and being fifth generation gives me tremendous pride. Yeah. But they, um, I think that the principles, they remain the same. I mean, shipping is a very uh, demanding and challenging uh, industry. But the main principles that I can summarize to a few that my grandfather taught me, which one of them is definitely the quick decision making, being obsessed with the micromanagement is another, being a prudent negotiator, while it's a, a third one. Uh, Proximity to officers and Being crew. always in command and being able to, you, to not allowing any problems, not letting any problems uh, uh, grow. I mean, these are principles that one can, can, can use as a foundation. Now, whether technology is going forward and whether the regulations and, uh, uh, and all the, the new uh, uh, elements of shipping are growing, this does not really change, in my opinion, the foundations of this. The essence uh, of shipping. Of, of industry. So I think, yes, I take, uh, I, 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 I take very seriously the foundations that were taught from generation to generation. That's encouraging. Mm -hmm. Long may it continue. Okay. I would like to thank you for this short discussion. Hopefully, uh, a year from now, we'll be looking back at the positive, successful shipping year, and we'll have other positive uh, issues to discuss and, and bring forward uh, for all of us involved in this exciting industry. Thank you for your okay, time. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Our next session involves Elizabeth Calvary. I'm glad to introduce to you this afternoon neuropsychologist, uh, trainer, and founder of Self Balance. Last year, in our live Slide to Open conference, Elizabeth spoke to us about the need to be adaptive and resilient on the bridge and ashore. This turned out to be more prophetic than anyone had expected, as this past year, has really been all about being resilient and adaptive. In the first part of this presentation, 
Elizabeth will walk you through an actual simulation exercise on a simulator, of course, and then Elizabeth will give you a few remarks and comments on what it is you will have watched. So we hope you find this engaging and informative, and we take it from there. Thank you. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Calberry, and we are at Prime's Marine Assessment and Training Center. What you are about to see is a live brain mapping exercise on one of Prime's bridge management simulators. The goal is to show you how one can merge training, assessment, and practical learning in one user-friendly program. In addition to hard skills, the use of a simulator can also help us focus on brain signals and other bodily signals like breathing, heart rate, muscle contraction, blood flow, sweat, and many other cues, and receive information that will help us understand how someone behaves, reacts, and thinks under stress. So what are we going to demonstrate today? We will place our officer under a scenario involving stress in the form of an unexpected situation. Electrical sensor will reconnect it to specific areas of the body in a user-friendly way. A band is placed around the abdomen to monitor breathing patterns and respiration rate. Another type of sensor is placed on the finger and will help detect blood volume changes. A sweat gland sensor attached around fingers will measure the activity of sweat glands and the amount of perspiration on the skin. And finally, a temperature sensor attached to a finger will measure blood flow to the skin. Further, I will use a separate device in the form of a headband. This will be placed to the scalp to help monitor brain waves. The readings creating a map of the brain's activity. The electrical information coming from the brain is measured, amplified, digitized, and transformed into brain waves. Using these computer graphics and prompts, the devices then help us to receive important feedback instantly on the way someone reacts physically and mentally. The following screen shows all the information from the different sensors we described above. We know that under stress, body temperature often drops and this helps us to understand the number of bodily reactions. Different combinations of brain waves involving frequency and strength can make the brain work more slowly, decrease processing speed, or more quickly increase processing speed. As may be imagined, both ends of the spectrum can have a negative impact on function. A brain that processes too slow may result in foggy thoughts and wrong decision-making. A brain that processes too quickly may result in anxiety, uh, raising thoughts, or even poor attention. Here we observe changes that occur in brain waves concerning attention and anxiety levels. Here you can observe that when under stress, the officer exhibits changes in brain waves that are involved in concentration and focus while his temperature has dropped, the heartbeat has increased, and all other signals measure uh, show that his body and mind were significantly taken over by stressful situation and reaction. This means that the officer struggles to defend his feelings and fear rather than the situation, and all this happened in an unconscious way. But when people are trained to control these vital changes, then they are able to feel confident, calm, focused, and ready to control the situation because their body and mind are not in defense. Everyday fatigue, lack of communication, personal difficulties, time restrictions, vetting procedures, all may influence people's reactions. The aim is to train people to observe, understand, and regulate instantly their own reactions. And this is a skill that can be learned. Having completed our initial assessment on the simulator, Training can subsequently be fun and rewarding through the use of a variety of exercises because your officers at sea are a reflection of all your efforts ashore. Remember that brain fit officers who remain in control of challenging situations create more effective and motivated crews. Thank you.
So here I am again. Hope you enjoyed this short video and that you are feeling as motivated as your officers and crews should be trained to feel. Expanding a bit further of what you just saw, it has been said that the gap between knowledge and action is around 20 years. In my field of, of expertise, however, there have been advancements that seem to condense this period of time. The use of the neurosciences has equipped us with ways to understand what is going on in the brain. And this is to the benefit of all of us. The more we know about certain functions, the more we can intervene and assist in solving issues that frequently are less complicated than what we are at first led to believe. So whether you want to admit it or not, there are two primary drivers that oversee the operations of your vessel, safe sailing. Both of these drivers occur in the human system. Your officer's hearts and your officer's brains. Your officer's hearts function as the CEO of your vessel. They are responsible for passion, purpose, motivation and balance. An officer's heart navigates the vessels while the brain could be viewed as the equivalent of a CFO. The brain's job is to make sure your officers has enough energy and resources to meet demands. It is the brain's responsibility, therefore, to make sure that the system does not take on more than it can handle and that when demands do increase, the necessary adjustments are made to compensate, make important decisions, be resilient, agile, focused and an effective communicator, to name just a few examples. As I'm sure you already know and you might have experienced, the CEO and the CFO might not always view matters from the same perspective. The same can happen to officers on board one of your vessels. This partnership, therefore, amongst officers must be carefully coordinated and is essential to the survival of your organization and the smooth sailing of your vessels. So while the CEO's job is to get the engine running, it is the CFO's responsibility to make sure that the engine keeps going on over time and the resources are constantly there to fuel it. In our exercise here, we just saw that regardless of the automation systems that we might have on board, if the human element runs out of ammunition and resources, then the results can be detrimental. In the case of our simulation, uh, the officer had adequate skills and training and a near accident was avoided. Therefore, it is important to always make sure that both the human element and a vessel's automation both run at their optimal levels. So in another slide, you can see that every miner has a responsibility towards the vessel, the team, the sea, but also to himself, herself. And this is what we train people to do, either on board or ashore, with a vast knowledge of the neurosciences and the number of valuable techniques we can use to observe human reactions, emotions and behavior. We train people to get to know themselves better, uh, control themselves more effectively, bounce back when they feel uh, vulnerable and exhibit their skills and expertise at their peak level whenever called upon to do so. This is what we all want from ourselves, to be ready, equipped with knowledge and the toolbox to use when things require more attention, patience, focus and resilience. So leadership is an action, not a position. And this is what everyone on board realizes through neural leadership trainings. Having instant feedback on your actions gives you the power to conquer difficulties, to conquer emotions and control behavior on board. The power of confidence on how to maneuver your own self is invaluable. And this is what the human brain can teach our body to do. Do not ignore the power of your brain and body. In conclusion, I would quote John F. Kennedy, who once said, we all come from the sea. And it is an interesting biological fact that all of us have in our veins the exact same percentage of salt in our blood that exists in the ocean. And we also have salt in our sweat and our tears. And I may add here that this percentage of salt, when measured, assessed and controlled, gives us emotions, behavior and power to change everything. By working and changing on the brain we have,
we can change the compass of our inner power. And this is what people in any field need to possess. Thank you so much. After this interesting presentation on uh, inner power and human brain, thank you very much. Um, we move to our new uh, panel discussion, and I'm here to welcome Dr. Vagelas, the Associate Professor um, on the part of the Department of Shipping, Trade and Transport of the University of Aegean, who will moderate um, our new discussion on the skill set of modern shipping manager. Right. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank the organizers for inviting me today in this interesting session. Uh, to begin with, uh, we are going to discuss a very interesting issue uh, dealing with uh, the soft skills in uh, the contemporary shipping industry. And as I said, uh, in order to begin with, uh, there are several studies uh, published in the last two years, both from the academia and the industry, uh, discussing and uh, listing a set of uh, non-technical skills the so-called soft skills, um, that aims to bridge, let's say, the gap between, uh, the, uh, between what the uh, education training has to offer and, of course, what are the actual, uh, the actual needs of, uh, of a shipping company. Uh, We're going to discuss these interesting issues along with uh, a set of uh, esteemed panelists. And uh, let me, first of all, introduce you to uh, our esteemed speakers uh, in alphabetical order, order of course. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Konstantinos uh, uh, Galanis, uh, who is the director for Dido Shipping and chairman of International Shipping Recycling Association. And of course, he has also a connection with uh, the academia as uh, he is a, an MIT educational counselor. Uh, we have Dr. Iraklis uh, Lazakis, a reader from uh, uh, the Naval Architecture, Ocean and Marine Engineer Department of uh, the Strathclyde University. And then we have Mr. Spiros Torais, the guy from the industry, uh, our, uh, let's say, representative from the shipping industry, uh, who is uh, the general manager of Olympic Vision Maritime and uh, the vice chairman of Intercargo. Uh, gentlemen, hello, and uh, thank you for being with us today. 
Uh, I was planning to start with uh, Mr. Lazakis, uh, who is also, uh, let's say, uh, a representative from the academia, but let me go directly to the core and uh, ask uh, Mr. Tarasis. Uh, what do you think uh, are, let's say, the most uh, uh, necessary skills uh, for someone wishing to pursue a career in the shipping industry today? First of all, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I just want to say uh, just one thing, and this, uh, I think, uh, will guide uh, uh, the discussion. Um, the most valuable asset of the shipping industry today is their people. So uh, this is where we have to focus, the people on board and the people ashore. And the next thing uh, that will have to guide the industry ahead is that now uh, the shipping industry is changing and it's changing a lot. Uh, and we need to work as teams. Um, individuals uh, so far have done the work. Now we need the teamwork to go forward. So. Yes, uh, we need uh, new skills, we need uh, soft skills, we need management skills, we need analytical skills, uh, and most of all, we need people with uh, high EQ uh, that can promote learning within the team. We live in, uh, in an era which uh, is uh, full with data, and we need to be able to uh, analyze this data and uh, keep it working for us, for the industry. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tarasis, and would like also to have the views of uh, Mr. Galanis and Mr. Lazakis. Uh, George, if you allow me, thank you very much for being with you today. And Heraklis, you will allow me to speak first. Uh, it's very interesting that I fully agree with uh, what uh, Spiros uh, just named. Uh, it's very interesting because we are uh, discussing about a well-established industry, the maritime industry. Uh, being, uh, you know, uh, an industry for several hundreds of years, uh, especially the maritime for us being Greek, uh, goes even further in the past. Uh, we do know what the future will bring, uh, mainly about the technological uh, changes and any other disruptions we will see. Nevertheless, uh, a combination of skills is something that right now is the prerequisite uh, of entering in a... Uh, managerial position that will allow to a human element to integrate the system. So definitely the knowledge uh, of uh, a ship or how a ship is operating and being on board the ship is very critical together with adaptability and efficiency, which I believe personally are two critical ad, uh, items that uh, a person should have to be a credible manager. And then I will pass uh, the floor to Heraklis. Mm -hmm. to Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, George, uh, Konstantinos, and uh, Spiros. Uh, nice seeing, seeing you again, and thanks for the kind invitation. Uh, overall, from my side, too, it's, um, it's essential uh, for uh, today's uh, managers and leaders within the shipping uh, sector, within the shipping industry as well, to have, uh, I would say, a strong uh, uh, theoretical background uh, in this area. And then being able also to uh, have an expertise and experience which can be provided from uh, in the field uh, actual work. And of course, all the other uh, soft skills as well, like being good communicators and negotiators and also be, be part of the, the team overall, I would say. Uh, in essence, in order to create a, a team culture within uh, the company or within the ship, I, that they, they may be uh, working on. So it's a, it's a good, uh, I would say, portion of, of different skills combined in order to have a, a good uh, well, member of a shipping company, good manager and leader as well. All right, thank you all for your uh, answers. And uh, uh, taking, let's say, uh, some hints from your answers, I would like to ask also, Heraklis, uh, what do you think that uh, the educational institutes, uh, the universities, uh, the training institutes, and so on, should do in order to respond to these uh, new needs of the shipping industry? Is there, uh, let's say, a, a need for uh, a, a direct discussion between the industry and the academy or not? No, absolutely, absolutely. I fully agree on that. Uh, educational institutions, um, I would say that they need to... Uh, 
uh, to be in constant communication uh, with the industry and, and be in touch with the industry in order to to be uh, able to, to adapt to the needs of the maritime, of the maritime sector. Uh, have a lot of uh, new technologies uh, coming up, we have a, a lot of new regulations uh, coming up, and all this need to be also uh, mirrored within the, the curriculum that is offered by uh, educational institution. Also, it is essential to have a, an institution that uh, provides and is accredited and uh, highly and internationally recognized mm -hmm. by professional bodies around the world, by uh, industry as such, in order to be able to transfer, um, I would say, a structured framework of uh, tools, of approaches that will be in the, in the educational institution's uh, subjects, in order to be transferred to uh, the, the maritime professionals as such. All right, and I think this is also an open, let's say, invitation both to Mr. Galanis and Mr. Tarasis. Uh, to be in touch, let's say, with uh, the academia in order to develop uh, what the industry needs in order to advance the soft skills. All right, thank you. And uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me move on to the next question. Uh, talking about uh, the skills, um, do you think that uh, this is something that can be developed only through education and training, or also there are some other parameters that uh, must be taken into account? Uh, do you think that, for example, uh, a university or a training institute can provide the necessary, um, uh, let's say, elements to the candidate in order to advance uh, its, uh, his or her skills. Or uh, there are also some other uh, issues that need to be taken into account, for example, the personality of uh, someone wishing to uh, have a career in shipping. And uh, let me start also, oh, yeah, I just forgot it, uh, with Mr. Tarasis, uh, who is uh, the representative of the industry, I think. Well, uh, I think that um, uh, right now the industry and uh, uh, the, the market, let's say, it's uh, full uh, with uh, people that have degrees and that have uh, um, the skills to come and visit uh, the, the industry. Uh, nevertheless, they have no experience. So uh, the best thing right now is to have people on board um, to be trained in the industry for the industry. Not only uh, having a degree or a master, but also to be trained uh, inside the industry for the industry. And I don't know if you're still here. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Galanis, uh, do you share the same view with uh, Mr. Dorasis uh, regarding, uh, let's say, uh, if there is any other element that should be taken into account apart from education and training in order to develop some skills? Sure, uh, although it's a panel that uh, we, we need to have some uh, different opinions, I have to fully agree <laughs> with uh, Spiros. Uh, first of all, uh, going back to the success of the Greek shipping industry, we have to remember that uh, you know, a, a shipping company is always you know, more successful the better the manager, uh, the seafarer are. So uh, going back to the you know, Greek style of you know, managing ships mm -hmm. without all these uh, you know, uh, digital tools that we currently have, you know, the best your master uh, is as a manager, the less the workload uh, for the office. Uh, on the other hand, we do have educational institutes that are theoretical, like Heracles pointed out, that they have to build some knowledge and some foundations uh, for the people to have a, a long-lasting uh, performance, while the professional institute should focus mainly uh, to actually increasing and integrating the skills. Uh, I, I have to say, as Spiros named, that uh, we do have a lot of candidates for the office uh, you know, personnel. Nevertheless, we still lack uh, to integrate our seafarer to make sure that all this knowledge, the uh, you know, the, the change and uh, shifting to new technology regulation, etc., have to be in a smart way uh, embedded and uh, integrated in our people on board the ships. This uh, is mm -hmm. the most critical uh, task right now. Also, I would like to ask uh, the same question to Mr. Lazaki, who is also, let's say, the academia expert. Uh, 
Thank you, George. Yeah. Well, uh, in this case, I would uh, also have to, to agree with Constantinos and the Spiros. It's, uh, it is, uh, in my, my mind, it's also essential to have, uh, uh, let's say, these two worlds going together hand in hand. The, the ethical, let's say, knowledge and the expertise that uh, can be achieved through uh, an institution, an academic institution, but also the practical experience, either through sailing experience, or through uh, new building and repair projects, um, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, we also need to consider, I believe that um, in essence, uh, today's uh, manager or a leader within a shipping company needs also to, uh, what we mentioned about the negotiating skills, the strategic uh, view, the uh, picture kind of view of, of things especially in an uh, ever-changing environment, such as the one within the shipping sector. And uh, also from, if I may say, from a, an academic's uh, point of view, uh, we need also to consider that uh, uh, how uh, professional, maritime professionals may wish to follow up with, a, with an academic degree, for example. Uh, in, um, well, up to now, this was mostly done through a full-time education, and people had to leave their jobs in order to attend, uh, let's say, an MSc or a PhD degree, etc. I believe that now we need, and we are moving slowly to that direction, that academic institutions are offering part-time degrees or distance learning degrees, so uh, professionals, maritime professionals, don't necessarily need to, to leave their jobs uh, in order to to acquire this additional theoretical uh, knowledge, which needs to be informed by industry as well. All right, uh, thank you. As we have a few more minutes, uh, I would like to ask you the following, uh, because okay, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, brought into the scene uh, the remote education, the, more, uh, the remote working. Uh, we are currently uh, in a studio here. You are in your offices. Uh, so do you think that uh, in the post-COVID era, uh, this trend will uh, remain and uh, might be, let's say, uh, a necessary skill for someone wishing to uh, pursue a career in shipping, to, let's say, to, to, uh, to, to, to be able to uh, handle uh, or to work uh, remotely. Um, yes, Lord, let me ask first uh, Mr. Lazakis, and then we can move to the other. Uh, yeah, I can go to it. Sure. Uh, well, in this case, um, uh, as you said, uh, George, it is a fast-changing world, and it is uh, uh, this. These changes have a tremendous impact on our day-to-day -day lives and our shipping as well. Um, overall, um, I believe there there will be some uh, a return to some kind of a normality, uh, as it used to be. But then that that will be a different type of uh, normal now. Some of the online uh, uh, tools and facilities and way of learning as well uh, will be still in place, uh, maybe not to the extent that they are just now, and, uh, living under the, the pandemic, uh, etc. But uh, there are lessons learned out of the, the current situations that uh, we can uh, take on board and uh, follow up with them. Mr. Dorasis, do you think that uh, teleworking is uh, here to stay? Uh, are we going to deal with it in the near future also? I would say that nothing stays forever, not uh, good, not bad. But uh, we, we live in a digital world, and uh, this will stay, uh, not in the same form, not in the same uh, uh, attitude, but uh, of course it will stay. And it will help a lot because it will make uh, uh, distances shorter. Um, uh, contact with one another easier. And of course, uh, the physical contact will never cease to exist, but uh, uh, digital will stay and we need it. And Mr. Velanis, just to close this session, uh, your view on this? Uh, technology, we have to remember, is a tool mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, human beings. We already have developed a digital life. Uh, I think we already have a digital business life. The idea is how you will be able to manage effectively your mm -hmm. digital mm -hmm. professional life. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities, especially for the younger ones, uh, to take this uh, crisis and turn it uh, into an effective way 
of assisting uh, the maritime industry to proceed in the future. So there are opportunities. There will be companies that will uh, work actually remotely uh, to cover some gaps. And uh, of course, this should be positive. Uh, maritime industry was uh, here. It will be here and it will prevail. Uh, we have seen this uh, during the last year. So I'm very positive that this uh, digital transformation uh, is, is here for good as long as you can actually be able to handle this uh, mm -hmm. for your own good and not just spend hours you know, being in front of a computer. All right, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. Skill and your skill that we have yeah. to learn. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And this is a new skill that uh -huh. we have to, to learn and teach. Exactly. Uh, to, to working, of course, the use of IT skills. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge, your experiences, and your expertise with us. Uh, it was a privilege being with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Vagelas, uh, for moderating such uh, um, an engaging discussion on leadership and shipping manager. I invite you to watch uh, with me and all our special guests now a video um, by Mr. Xanakoudis, the director of uh, Worldwide Business Operation and manager director of the Marshall Island Registry on the current challenges and also an overall forecast for shipping industry. Let's watch it. I think the lockdown uh, changed completely our life. Travel restrictions, lockdowns in uh, many countries around the world uh, completely changed the way we uh, were doing things, both socially and, and business. Uh, we had to come up with uh, solutions since uh, we couldn't do inspections, we couldn't do audits, normal routine stuff like uh, surveys on ships, so we had to come up with uh, different solutions on things. Uh, but I think the the main challenge, which is still an ongoing issue today and uh, the industry is still closely looking into this, are the crew changes. What we did in the Marshall Islands to overcome the problem, I think uh, the fact that we have a network of 28 offices across the globe really helped us to provide the seamless service to all of our clients world without, uh, worldwide, giving them uh, the best and the most efficient service uh, without any uh, disruptions or problems. I think the most important development for that happened last year because of COVID was the use of uh, the extensive use of uh, technology. The innovative ideas that uh, we had to, to come up with and the quick decisions we had to take to overcome the problems. For example, we, we, in the Marshall Islands Registry, we did more than uh, 900 uh, remote inspections uh, uh, since last year, since COVID uh, came in our life. And we had to amend our legislation to, uh, to allow electronic signatures in uh, certain documents or transactions. So we are able to do even uh, remote closings. So we don't have any delays on ship deliveries or uh, sale and purchase of ships. I think this is, this is very important and um, um, all the industry, all the industry stakeholders worked closely together to overcome the problem on this. The biggest challenge in uh, 2021, I th we are already in the first quarter of 2021 anyway, but I think the biggest challenge ahead of us not only for this year, but for next year as well, it is, it is to set up the phase for a post-COVID era. The fact that we came up with new solutions like remote audit inspections, remote meetings, remote seminars, it's completely a new trend, but uh, physical meetings will come back in our life again when uh, COVID is away from our lives. So I think the, the most important and the basic challenge we have is to combine both remote and physical work 
and uh, or even have a, a more effective uh, regulatory framework that we will need for to combine uh, both remote and, and physical business. We became stronger out of uh, out of COVID. Uh, I'm, I'm by nature I'm a positive person, so I think that uh, we have better times ahead of us. But the main message is exactly this: we we became this is completely new world. I mean, the, we were navigating and we're still navigating in uncharted waters. But one thing that we learned is that uh, we are strong enough to deal with this, and uh, we became adaptable and innovative. We established new things, uh, we came up with new ideas, we found solutions on many things. So I think the main message for everyone in this industry and around the world overall is that uh, uh, we can do everything and we can uh, uh, overcome uh, many problems. So we'll be done. This is an interactive conference and it is the time for a poll. And we really welcome and encourage your participation. Uh, our next speaker, Dr. Christos Giselis, Senior Digital Transformation Analyst of Ute Group, will introduce and speak also about it in detail. Um, meanwhile, um, I welcome you to go to www.mendit.com and enter the code 52854341 in order to participate on what services data would you be interested in. Let's listen to Dr. Gizelis. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of OT Group and the DataPorse project, it is my privilege for being here today and present our work. DataPorse is an innovation project funded by the European Commission. With highly skilled industry partners, SMEs, universities, and research centers from all over Europe and Israel. Today at Sipping Finance 2021, we run a poll survey, so you can place your vote on what services or data would you be interested in providing or purchasing. Now, our vision is to be a part of the seaports transformation journey. Dataports aims to transform seaports from interconnected to smart and cognitive, offering a secure and trusted environment for data integration and AI-based services the entire community can benefit from. Hence, we design and develop a distributed data-driven platform where data from many sources and different actors can be shared. Blockchain is the core technology that ensures security and trust. A seaport can offer data and advanced services to, to its ecosystem. OTE sees an opportunity in this emerging data-driven market and participates as a data provider offering anonymized mobility data for traffic optimization in the local area. Why a data-driven uh, platform? Because the information gives answers to the companies. For better customer insights, improved decision-making, new forms of collaboration, and of course, expand their customer base. And also creates opportunity for businesses to monetize their data, for the citizens to have control over their own data, and access to services. For the research community to have access to this data, but also for the public bodies in order to create innovative AI-based services. At DataPorts, we foresee a seaport uh, uh, ecosystem with more players than already known ones, like trade associations, transport authorities, startups, museums. They can also be on board in this initiative. The entire port community around the seaport can become stakeholders and benefit from the offered services. This is DataPorts project, and if you'd like to know more about DataPorts, please visit our webpage or send us an email. Thank you.
While the poll is still running for all of you, I have the great pleasure to welcome Ms. Katerina Stathopoulou, the Executive Director of Investments and Finance and the Governor of International Propeller Club, Port of Piraeus. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Over the next 30 minutes, my distinguished speakers and I will be discussing the shipping industry's responsiveness over the years. Please allow me to introduce them to you. Mr. Nikolaos Fragistas, Chief Executive Officer of Franco Compania Naviera. Mr. Michalis Kokinis, Founder and Managing Director of Golden Destiny Group. Mr. George Makrimichalos, President of Embros Lines Shipping. Mr. John Platsidakis, Honorary Chairman of Intercargo. Intercargo. Good evening, gentlemen, and welcome. The maritime good industry, evening. good evening, hello to everybody. <laughs> the maritime industry has faced numerous turbulent waters over time, triggered by wars, world financial crisis, as well as supply and demand imbalances in tonnage. The crisis of the 80s, among other things, was a, clear, was a shipping crisis caused by supply and demand imbalances. Thereafter, shipping, has continued on a roller coaster ride leading up to Lehman Brothers. Lehman sparked a world financial crisis, which of course affected the maritime industry. 90% of world goods, world trade, is carried by ships. So money and ships make the world go round. Let's begin with some perspectives. Nico, can you please give us a brief overview, timeline overview, of the crisis that shipping has encountered since the early 1900s. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, shipping encountered uh, around 10 major crises during the last 100 years. Being an international business, its fate is very closely connected with international economical and political events. I will list here the most uh, significant ones. So we had two world wars, the 1918 World War and the 1940-45 Second World War. In both cases, Greek shipping was totally decimated. Uh, as an example, at the end of World War II, we had only 150 ships uh, being Greek ships. Then we had three financial crises. The first was the 1929 uh, Wall Street crisis, Black Tuesday, and this crisis created chaos to the world economy and lasted for many years. Um, we had another one uh, that, some, that I, I, I lived through it, the 1997 Asian crisis. This lasted for two years, and the reason was that Thailand decided no longer to peg the local currency back to the dollar, and, it, and then we had uh, uh, many Asian currencies fell as much as 38%, stocks declined by 60%. I will give you a very quick example. A 27,000 uh, deadweight ship bought for nine and a half in the summer 97, within six months fell to five and a half. And on the opposite side, by 2008, the same ship was worth 24 million. Wow. Uh, the third financial crisis is the one Katerina mentioned. It's the Lehman one. I'm not going to spend much time in it. Uh, Katerina already said uh, there was no trading, no credit. The global economy went to, um, into recession. And as usual, uh, during uh, the crisis, uh, just before the crisis, because of the uh, Asian, uh, the, the China boom, she put us all the ships. So in 2010, 11, and 12, uh, there were uh, 3,420 3, sh ships delivered. This is a staggering 40% of the 2010 uh, fleet at the time, which stood at 8,110 ships. Uh, we had the, as well an oil crisis, 7073, uh, due to the shortage of oil and the dramatic increase of its price, which affected the, the whole uh, globe. All economies had problems. And then I, I come to the, the one, uh, I started my career during this uh, crisis, 81, 85. Uh, probably this is the worst since the Second World War. 
this was an oil, an economic, an interest rates, and a high inflation. Uh, I remember we paid to a bank 23% and the interest installment was 23%. So you can imagine how bad things were. Uh, by 1983, 700 Greek ships were laid up. When uh, I was coming with the airplane, uh, you could see 450 vessels laid up uh, in LFC's bay. Uh, I, I will give you another example. A 27,000 dollar, uh, eight year old bar carrier uh, was worth in 82 about six. By 84, it went to 50%, about 2.8. By 85, it went even further down 1.6. Uh, during this crisis, many powerful shipping companies uh, went bust. Uh, Dry cargo had to operate in an environment of, uh, you know, every year the market was dropping and dropping and dropping. Again, uh, ship owners had ordered ships. So between 81 yes. and 85, we had 1,358 ships. Uh, uh, you want me to stop? Thank or... you, Nico. <laughs> and then we, had, to... and then we had the COVID crisis that we're all living now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Nico. I am sure I will come back to you. You are my walking encyclopedia. Okay, uh, Mihaly, can you please give us um, some, can you s please add, if you wish, some more color to what Nico shared with us with your experience as an S&P broker? Well, Nico's uh, almost covered everything, but uh, I try to, <laughs> to add something. I mean, uh, the crisis of 80s was a crisis, but also it was a period of opportunities. Because uh, if we look around, we will see that the number of uh, substantial names of the Greek shipping were not existing in the 70s, and they started in the 80s. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the big problems of that area, of, of that time, was the, um, the very heavy interest rate that uh, Nicole said uh, uh, the LIBOR was 18 and half. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, this uh, did not help the trade. Uh, so the crisis, the imbalance is not coming only uh, by, by banking reasons, but also it's a matter of uh, supply and demand in the overall. Uh, this very heavy interest rate uh, caused big problems to the traders to the, uh, who reduced their stocks. And of course, by reducing the stocks, they reduced their exposure to the bank. And of course, they reduced the trade. Uh, then we came to the, to the, and of course, the, in the 80s, we faced the phenomenon of the oversupply of new tonnage, which was coming from the Japanese shipyard, because in the 70s and probably the late 60s, a number of Greek ship owning companies ordered a substantial volume of ships. I mean, I know from a, a shipping family from my, my island that uh, they had ordered in Japan more than 80 ships. Wow. And how many ships have such a volume of mobility nowadays? <laughs> so uh, the, then we came to the decade of 90s, which was uh, without very important issues, but uh, we have seen this uh, crisis at the end of uh, uh, 97, when the seven tigers of the East uh, had financial problems. And of course, this affected also the freight market and affected the, the new building prices. If we will uh, recall, uh, Panamax delivered 99. It was ordered only 19 million. Uh, figures were very low. And then uh, we came to the decade of uh, 2000 uh, at the beginning of which, I mean, till 2003, it was a very difficult period. And people did not know what to do. I had a, a strain, a, a nice case where I had a, a seller who was going to sell a Panamax. And I had also a buyer who wanted to buy a Panamax. The seller was telling me, Michael, be careful. We should not miss the client. <laughs> and, and the buyer was saying, Mike, are you sure that we are doing the right movement? <laughs> well, this vessel was bought at three and a half million dollars. And uh, three years later, they had an offer 
for 30 million. 30? Which is not a 10 times the <laughs> price. Wow. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, of course, uh, Lehman Brothers was not the cause of the trouble. The Lehman Brothers was the trigger. Um, the, it, it, we had seen in the uh, 2000 era um, very easy money coming into the market. True. And uh, let me pick, pick on that. Let me uh, take off from what you just said, easy money, and um, go to John. And John, I would like to hear from your experience over these years, both from the financing side and the ownership side, of course. Have you seen similarities and or differences in how the industry has behaved through these trials and peaks? Thank you, Katerina. Because I'm far too young, with your permission, I will start in 1980. And you not certainly are. <laughs> Uh, that was actually the time in January 1980 when I joined uh, the shipping uh, sector of, uh, by being uh, uh, an officer at Bank of America in ship finance. Uh, and later on, some 10 years later, in the shipping uh, companies. Um, I think I was fortunate enough, first of all, as a banker at the time, to see the crisis of the 80s. It was a great school. Uh, not only because uh, somebody could see how the market could evolve and the peaks and ups, downs, uh, but also the behavior of several personalities in crisis. That was, as far as I'm concerned, an, a, a very valuable experience. Um, in the 80s, yes, as my predecessor said, there was a huge crisis and... Uh, Far too many things happened. Companies vanished, or other companies established themselves and took, took opportunity of the status of the market. Uh, it was also followed by the withdrawal of international banks from ship finance. Not necessarily because shipping was in a bad uh, shape, but uh, mostly, I would say, and to a large extent, that applied to the major American banks that were very active in. Greek shipping, uh, particularly, uh, because of the collapse of commercial real estate in the United States. Thereafter, things uh, changed a lot. And I think what really changed the world thereafter was uh, globalization, was the uh, enhancement of uh, world trade, was the, uh, the activation of uh, China, the huge increase in ton miles in world trade, and uh, the huge expansion of the world fleet. Of course, as a result of that, we saw excessive um, freight rates that led far too many uh, ship owners, Greek ship owners uh, as well, to go from second-hand vessels to new buildings. And uh, regrettably, later on, the mistakes uh, came up and uh, the bill was paid. In terms of financing, the banks did come back, but also the capital markets uh, started uh, being active. In the 80s, also in the late 80s, it was a very shallow market. The understanding was very limited, and I don't think anybody was considering becoming a shipping analyst um, in, uh, in the late 80s. Thereafter, we saw eventually... Uh, public companies, mostly addressing themselves to investors, um, mostly, I would say, speculative investors, but later on to more dedicated uh, pub, uh, private equity. And of course, we saw uh, many fancy products, uh, such as the MLPs and what happened to them. Uh, um, and of course, leasing came, uh, came uh, as well, along with other uh, financing tools. So I think shipping has seen far too many changes within that uh, period. Mm. I will agree with you. Um, George, can you also share with us your thoughts on uh, this discussion? On yeah. the trials and the peaks over uh, the well, crisis? Sure, I mean, I can mostly comment on what happened post Lehman because uh, that's the most um, vivid memory I have of a crisis. And, um, I think that uh, I, I agree, of course, with my predecessors, uh, Nicholas uh, and uh, Michael, that the, of course, the Lehman shock wasn't um, a shipping uh, 
uh, it wasn't a, a crisis that was caused by by ship by ship owners. <clears throat> Something which, by the way, we are very good at. Yeah. We we create our own crisis by over ordering ships, and uh, uh, that's uh, but that that's what happens to a, such a fragmented market as shipping is. So <clears throat> so it was mostly a trust problem, I would say. <clears throat> it was a, a problem that banks didn't trust each other. Uh, they didn't know what they were holding in their books. Uh, letters of credits were not were not opened, and uh, trade finance basically went into a halt. Uh, there was a, a lot of uh, willingness to trade and uh, for goods to be physically moved, and we saw that um, uh, very profoundly as the you know the recovery was very was V shaped and. Uh, uh, after Lehman, uh, rate, freight rates for dry bulk shipping went basically more or less where they were before the crisis. Uh, so yeah, so basically it was a, it was a it was a trust problem, and uh, of course that had the ripple effects because uh, on the whole banking industry, especially in Europe, uh, we saw major big banks, traditional banks that they were lending Greeks, I mean, everybody knows what happened to Royal Bank of Scotland, which holded basically the blue chip companies, uh, uh, had a portfolio of, of, of Greek uh, blue chip companies that went basically disappeared, vanished. Uh, but also others followed. Uh, and so the, the pie went, you know, went quite, was, went smaller and uh, there were not many alternatives for Greeks. So, then that's where the creativity came in, and uh, we had to uh, try to get finance uh, from other sources, whether that is leasing companies in China or Japan or uh, working with uh, funds or what have you. And um, uh, so, I mean, of course, a lot of more equity. We needed to put a lot more equity into the ships. Banks didn't accept. To give such a high percentage of uh, finance, which was typically eighty percent or maybe even higher, in some cases, uh, which in my my view that's that was a good thing because they created discipline into the market and uh, uh, gave a good lesson uh, for everybody that uh, uh, you know you cannot overstretch yourself basically and uh, yeah. So okay, let's hope we, we, we learned our lesson. Um, John, I would like to go back to you, although you did give us some points, and um, ask you about the capital markets. You said before that um, you, we've become more sophisticated. A lot of products ca have come into uh, our lives. Uh, however, I know that you were with a company, of the, one of the first companies that listed itself in the capital markets in the 80s and then delisted itself. And I would like you in very short, um, very short, um, concise words to give me what do you believe are the similarities or differences in the capital markets, how they have reacted from the 80s until now? Have they changed or do they continue to be do they continue to have the same philosophy, although there are new products out there? Oh, certainly they changed. Uh, uh, at that time, the public in general was not aware of shipping. Uh, certainly today, uh, money does come to shipping for, um, for investment and uh, having a very good understanding of it. Not necessarily the commitment that uh, the shipping industry was expecting, but they do come. Uh, there is plenty of analysis, shipping analysis around. Uh, there are uh, the banks, uh, the underwriters are there. The, the money is there. There's much more money today than in the past. So, yes, certainly it has changed a lot. Now, um, how it is going to evolve in the future, uh, it will continue to be an interesting subject for, uh, for this kind of money. But um, there have been some uh, black spots as well. Uh, so, of course, memories are short. I wouldn't say that uh, people will uh, necessarily remember, but uh, there have been a, a number of spots of black spots uh, in this uh, process. But it will stay. There is no doubt about it. They, the private equity will coming in and out, but it will stay. 
Yeah. Um, Nico, uh, can you share with us um, some similarities or differences in uh, how ship owners uh, have reacted over this time or financiers very shortly? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I think that the fundamental difference between the 80s and uh, now is that the banks at the time were more flexible and each bank had its own policy towards each individual client. Now, the banks, due to the basic regulations, uh, are over-regulated. Uh, as George said, we had the specialized ship mortgage bank, we have the, the traditional banks, and uh, you could find finance, although I remember that when you in 85, 84, where things were very bad, it was difficult to get finance. Um, today, the banks that the traditional banks has shrunk, but there's a new phenomenon there is a new players entering the sectors, which is this private equity funds, which are not investing with equity, but they giving loans to the owners at a very high cost. So we can say that in the 80s, you had high cost of funds with low spreads, and now you have low cost of funds with high spreads, <laughs> you know. Okay, so we've made a nice circle, and we'll go back again. Roller coaster, okay. uh, Michali. Um, as an S&P broker, I'm sure that banks may have been approaching you over all these times. Is there a pattern where they saying the same things <laughs> they were telling you as an S&P broker when they were having issues with their loans as the, they were after Lehman? Well, uh, the we have a number of cases not only during this heavy crisis, uh, that uh, banks were trying to help their clients who had trouble. And the best help that they could provide is to, to sell the vessel to, to another buyer uh, who was, had better financial status, who would be prepared to pay a bit more on the price, provided that he would get an extensive uh, finance. True. And uh, we were invited in a number of cases to try to see how we can structure such a, a, a deal to save the one and to help the other. Okay, uh, to save both sides, uh, essentially. Yes. Uh, we're, we're in this uh, scheme. Okay, good. Thank you. Now, gentlemen, we are, it's been very interesting, but we're very quickly. John, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Yes, now I can. Uh, I think banks in general try to help, with some very few exceptions. What makes the difference, and um, possibly Michal will agree with me, is uh, the behavior of the clients vis-a-vis -vis the banks. Okay. Uh, some people forgot that uh, banks are typically big entities, big organizations. There is a lot of reporting in the past as well, so it's, it's a creature that has to, to, to be taken care of in a special way. Okay, thank you. Well, gentlemen, we're really quickly running out of time. So I have a very, um, very important last question, and I want you to be very brief. What do you believe is the strong point of Greek shipping, which has held it afloat and makes it stronger after each crisis? George? One well, sentence. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, the the uh, the regime, the the tax and legal regime in Greece. I think the platform is very sound, very competitive, and uh, all governments uh, have recognized Greek uh, ship Greek shipping as uh, one of these three pillars, alongside with tourism and agriculture. So I think that's a very important uh, thing. Yeah. That has held us can... afloat. Thank you, Nico that uh, shipping is in the, our DNA. I think there's tradition since the ancient times. And, uh, and what George said as well is very important. So all these things have helped uh, Greek shipping to flourish. Thank you. You said very, I can, sp I can say more things if you want. No, 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 if we have time, give me, John. Yeah. <laughs> Can't hear you. Sorry. John, can I, you repeat, please? The, yes. yes, I would say the adaptability to ever-changing uh, market conditions, the hands-on management, the fact that it is very close to the ship and the crew, 
uh, and also having the guts to invest and expand uh, in crisis. Thank you. Michali? Well, the, the Greek entrepreneurship is a very important thing, but the, the shipping culture is this is which is keeping the Greek shipping so much competitive. And we have to help um, our country and our nation that we have to, to support the seafarers profession to remain with the Greek hands. Because from the seafarers, we create also uh, the shipping executives. True. But if we don't help uh, our shipping industry to have a lot of more, more and more than less and less uh, seafarers, Greek at seafarers. the end, we are going to have Filipino shipping operators. Thank you, Michali. I think you closed it uh, off uh, beautifully, and I think all four of you have uh, given, put forward excellent points. Thank you, gentlemen, for this very interesting and insightful discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have found our panel discussion uh, interesting and enjoyable. I am now going to say good evening and good night and goodbye. Thank you. Good evening and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fafouli, for moderating such a profound discussion, as always. Uh, it's been an honor. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. And later, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, exciting news. Thank you for your participation. Uh, our wonderful team here has already collected um, the poll, and we can see it on the screen, on what services or data would you be interested in. And we see that the 50% um, of you decided uh, as we see now on the full screen on goods and people tracking and then 25% on ports operation and rest 25% on financial and tracking related services. Thank you so much for your participation. Now we will continue um, with uh, Thank you very much for having me speak at this very important event. It's important for me personally, as I've just bought my first boat, a 20-foot Norfolk Gypsy Sloop, having spent a lifetime in sailing in the sea, but also importantly, 23 years working in sustainability. And my interest is how sustainability pressures are a driver for innovation and commercial success, and in particular, how technology can unlock new ways of working and new business models. Over the next 10 minutes, I want to do three things. Firstly, set the context. Why is this important and how are leaders responding? Secondly, I want to give you three areas that I think you should prioritize. And then finally, I want to talk about the immediate opportunity for you. Now, climate change will be sudden and cataclysmic. The, these are strong words, and in fact, they're a quote from the chief risk officer at Zurich Insurance. And addressing climate change is just one of the 17 major UN sustainable development goals that we are collectively committed to delivering by 2030. And if we don't deliver, we put ourselves on a very dangerous trajectory for humanity and for the quality of life that all of us aspire to have. Now, today, based on work that Accenture's done surveying CEOs for the United Nations Global Compact, only 21% of CEOs feel that businesses are currently playing the role that they should be in delivery of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And unfortunately, we're not on track to deliver any of those goals, and reaching them is even harder now post the corona pandemic. If we just look at climate, today we're on track for a 250% increase in greenhouse gas emissions from shipping by 2050 if no action is taken. And if we look at a price on carbon 
34% of the industry's EBITDA is at risk. And that's just assuming today's price of $40 per ton. Most expect the price to be substantially higher than that in the coming decade. Now, Accenture's CEO, Julie Sweet, has said that every business will need to be a sustainable business by 2025. And we're going to see quite dramatic reshaping of industries over the coming five to 10 years as we try to address those sustainable development goals. And my view is this is your chance in the shipping industry to step up and be part of that very important change. Now, the good news is many in your industry are already stepping up to take bold, ambitious action and to scale the solutions that are needed. And of course, this will be supported by actors across the value chain, cross-industry collaboration, policy, advances in technologies. We see companies like Maersk and Shell uh, taking amazing leadership. Maersk, for example, will operate the world's first carbon neutral liner vessel by 2023, seven years ahead of schedule. And Shell is doing incredible things in their investments in hydrogen and in fuel cells to decarbonize shipping. And we're also seeing amazing leadership across the value chain. So for example, Unilever has announced in June uh, of last year that it will reach net zero emissions from all of its products by 2039. And that's a clear demand signal that cargo owners will need to help drive uh, that reduction in their part in the uh, carbon emissions of Unilever's supply chains. But that signal will also help to support your commercial case for investment in zero emission shipping. IKEA is another great example. Uh, they've committed to being climate positive by 20, 20, 2030, targeting transportation as an area to improve. Now, if we go on to the areas that I think you as a shipping industry should prioritize, I promise you three areas that I think that you should focus on. The first is net zero, and you will see over the coming months, businesses around the world committing to net zero. They will set science-based targets, and they will commit to driving out carbon emissions across their value chains. They will join what's called the race to zero in the run up to the major climate conference that we'll see in Glasgow in November. And of course, this isn't just about your own operations. We know that over 40% of CEOs are already looking into decarbonization strategies across their supply chains. And what's called scope three emissions, which are across the value chain are as important and will mean greater scrutiny on your footprint and shipping from those other stakeholders in your value chains. Secondly, I want you to focus on being trusted. Trust is about being transparent in your responsibilities. It's about how risks are being managed, especially social risks, and being predictable in how you operate. Social risks in particular, such as health and safety, anti-corruption and human rights, not just in your own operations, which I know you already take extremely seriously, but in the full value chain. And in particular, when we see advances in technology, these responsibilities are becoming much, much more visible um, and extend up through your procurement and your sourcing, but also down to end of life, for example, in ship breaking. And finally, the third priority is about building more circular value chains. We're going to move from today's make, ship, use, dispose model to a, a more circular value chain where we keep resources in productivity beyond end of life, and we drive more productive value from the materials and assets we use, of course, reducing downtime, reducing wastes, and ultimately cutting costs. And it's about designing for end of life, uh, designing for resource recovery, especially ship recycling. It's about looking at more bio-based materials, light weighting of materials to improve fuel efficiency, and of course, playing your role in industry collaborations like industrial clusters, which are all part of building a more circular economy. Now, finally, on the opportunity of getting it right, we think the opportunity here is substantial for the shipping industry. 
if you haven't got a strategy, if you're not setting stretching targets and you haven't got a plan, you need one now. Whatever that strategy is, we think it will almost certainly include three immediate areas of opportunity. Firstly, innovation in ship design, equipment and fuels. And this is particularly important in areas like hydrogen, in biofuels, and those bridging technologies that will help us move to low carbon or zero carbon fuels. But it's also about driving improvements in ship design to improve efficiency. Secondly, we think there's an opportunity in driving more efficient port and shipping operations. So improving visibility of your emissions, your fuel consumption, your resources and material usage to drive efficiency, and of course, safety in port and on the high seas. And technology will be a key enabler, the combination of big data, of analytics, of artificial intelligence and remote sensing to help you identify where there are opportunities to drive those efficiencies. And then finally, don't do this on your own. There is a key opportunity to do this in collaboration and through partnerships. And there are many organizations, many partners, many industry players working on this agenda who want to work with you. For example, the Getting to Zero Coalition is a powerful alliance of more than 120 companies within the maritime, the energy and infrastructure and finance sectors supported by governments and NGOs to help work with you. And if you're not involved in these industry coalitions, you need to be. So in conclusion, rather than seeing the sustainable development goals as a barrier or a challenge, we think they offer a amazing route map for innovation. Almost every country has signed up to them. They provide a clear direction of policy, of technology investment and citizen participation. And ultimately, we firmly believe that sustainability will be a driver of new growth and of new revenue. It offers a new lens of efficiency and cost reduction. It offer, offers a new way to manage new types of risks across your business. And it offers an opportunity for you to differentiate in the market where investors, consumers, cargo owners are increasingly factoring these issues into their decision making. This is an exciting time. Uh, it's an important time for this agenda, but this is the decade of delivery and it is your chance to step up and play your role. Thank you very much. It was really interesting listening to Mr. Justin Kibble, the Manager Director of Accenture's European Sustainability Services. Now, please join me to watch the Executive Director of Strategy and Business Development of VEPA Commercial, Mr. George Polychronio. Good evening and congratulations to Shipping Finance for organizing this conference. We are all aware that we have just 10 years to reach the EU's target to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 55% compared to 1990 levels, a target to allow Europe to fulfill its obligations under the Paris Treaty. Given the role of shipping in the global economy, this sector will increasingly be called to take action. The IMO's ambitious targets to halve greenhouse gas emissions from ships by 2050 are a case in point and 2023 specific measures will be proposed. We also face the prospect of the designation of the Mediterranean Sea as an ECA for sulfur oxide emissions. So there is growing pressure. Decarbonization while maintaining the competitiveness is the biggest challenge facing shipping and finding solutions to decarbonize today rather than tomorrow is critical. The solution is to use LNG as a marine fuel because, frankly speaking, today LNG is the cleanest and most competitive fuel available in sufficient volumes. Briefly, LNG produces lower CO2 emissions and hardly no nitrogen oxides 
particulate matters or sulfur oxides, it is 20 to 25 percent less carbon intensive than heavy fuel oils. The methane slip issue is being addressed and methane emissions can be and are being reduced. Studies show that by investing in LNG fueled vessels, ship owners can cut greenhouse emissions by 21% compared with oil-based marine fuel over the life cycle and 28% on a tank-to-wake basis. Significantly, LNG is forecasted to remain competitive against the very low sulfur fuel oil VLSFO and is less vulnerable than oil to price fluctuations and geopolitical tensions. There may also be potential for other fully sustainable options, including biofuels, ammonia and hydrogen, but these are still being tested. But don't forget that liquefied biomethane LBM and liquefied synthetic methane LSM are also fully sustainable options, and studies indicate that they will be commercially competitive compared to other carbon neutral fuels. A major advantage of LBM and LSM is that they can be bunkered and stored using existing LNG infrastructure and LNG fueled ships can switch to LBM and LSM all with only minor modifications. So LNG will facilitate the shift to low and zero emission fuels. The shipping sector recognizes the benefits of LNG as marine fuel, with the number of LNG fueled ships predicted to grow for many classes of vessels. This demand is possible because of the increasing availability of LNG bunkering and infrastructure. From 12 bunkering vessels in 2020, CLNG organization reports that 27 are on order or being commissioned of which the majority will, will come into service until 2023. Strikingly, LNG can be delivered in 96 ports and there are plans for a further 55. Notably, bunkering and infrastructure are becoming available in the East Mediterranean. Specifically, via the Poseidon Med 2 and Blue Hubs projects, DEPA Commercial will, with partners in Greece, Cyprus and Italy, is preparing the groundwork for the region's adoption of LNG as marine fuel. The result is that by 2022 and 2023, the Revithusa LNG terminal will have in, in operation a truck loading station and a new small-scale LNG jetty to serve smaller feeder bunkering vessels of capacity between 1,000 to 20,000 cubic meters. A semi-ballastable barge transporter will be delivered this year in Venice to operate in the Mediterranean and Adriatic seas. Two bunkering vessels will be constructed for operations for 2023 in Cyprus and Greece, the latter by DEPA Commercial. To conclude, shipping faces a huge challenge to decarbonize. LNG constitutes the only proven technology which today ensures shipping's compliance with the 2030 and 2050 climate-driven objectives. Last but not least, it is said that the future belongs to those who prepare for it. We are supporting shipping by promoting a fit-for-purpose regional LNG supply chain and aim to turn Greece into an international marine banking hub for Southeast Europe. Have you visited our 3D virtual venue by the sea? Let us take you on a virtual tour.
Assembly. So we bid on. Through to our annual appointment with the Shipping World, we are happy to invite you to the fourth Slide Open Shipping Finance 2021. last for today, our last panel discussion, and uh, I'm, I will welcome uh, Mrs. Danai Bezantaku, CEO, Navigator um, of Navigator Shipping Consultants and Secretary General of International Propeller, Propeller Club, uh, Port of Piraeus, and concept founder of Yes Forum. Um, she will moderate our, new, our final panel, um, on ocean going shipping. And together with her, it's gonna, there are going to be special guests Mr. Alexandratos, Mr. Fafalios, Mr. Fragulis, Mr. Hadzi Pateras, Mrs. Palu, and Mrs. Helen Polychronopoulou. So, hello, and thank you very much for the honor to have me. Uh, as a moderator of this important panel, I would like at this point to thank Despina Travlou and the great organization of Slide Open. 2020 has been a surprise for the world, not for shipping. It has not stopped even for a minute. So I am now today here with you with a very important panel. And I would like now to welcome George Alexandratos, General Manager. Uh, of uh, Apollonia Lines, SA, and Vice President of Hellenic Chamber of Shipping, Dimitris Fafalios, Chairman of Intercargo, President and Director of Fafalios Limited, Kostis Fragul, Founder and CEO of Franman, and President of uh, the Board of Governors of International Propeller Club, Port of Perius, Alex Hadzipateras, Executive Vice President of Dorian LPG, Semira Mispaliu, Chairperson of Helmepa and uh, Chief Executive Officer of Guiana Shipping. And uh, last but not least, Eleni Polychronopoulou, President of Helmexpo and uh, Business Development Manager of Erma First. I would like to welcome you all, uh, great friends. Uh, I, uh, I will start al alphabetically. We have many important things to discuss and uh, the previous panels have been very, very interesting. And uh, what I am uh, keeping from uh, the previous panel and my friend Katerina was that uh, we, uh, shipping faced 10 crises in 100 years. So shipping is used in crisis and every crisis is an opportunity. So let's see what uh, uh, this, this crisis is bringing to us. I would like to start with uh, George Alexandratos. Uh, the, the, the title of the panel is A Sequence of Excellence, uh, Ocean Going Shipping, the Maritime Cluster, and the Human Capital. So we will try to cover uh, all of these uh, to important topics. George, there has been a big uh, debate the last few months about the EU Green Deal. Can you share with us your thoughts representing the Hellenic Chamber of any initiatives that will be possibly taken for Yes, hello, good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I have to thank very much Mrs. Despina Travlu, my friend, for her kind invitation. And I would like very, very much to congratulate uh, both Despina and uh, her team for this excellent uh, webinar. We uh, just came uh, after the virtual tour and I'm looking forward also to see the next two sessions. Also, it is an honor for me to represent the Hellenic uh, Chamber of Shipping amongst uh, those uh, uh, co-panelists, uh, which who more of them are friends of uh, myself. Uh, they do not have only successful track record, but they are also quality characters and personalities. And for me, that is very, very important for what we say at Greek shipping. Now, reference to your question. We at the Hellenic uh, Chamber of Shipping, uh, we're trying to overcome that amongst other initiatives by being, let's say, wholly heartily engaged the last two years in an ambitious plan uh, to open a path for opportunity for our coastal public transport services 
that will gradually lead to green shipping and may provide uh, employment, we hope for that, to many as well as considerable local added value. Now, in close now cooperation with the passenger ship association and the valuable lens of PWC, together with the National Technical University of Athens, our proposal has received enthusiastic support, I have to tell you, uh, by the and Prime Minister in person, who had a very fruitful conversation with our President George Pateros, from whom you have his wonderful regards and a very good success for your seminar. Fortunately, he's at Caribbean uh, for a dry dock for his vessel. So that project has been also not only by the Prime Minister, but from members of the Cabinet uh, and also from the European Union institutions. The business plan began with 4.5 billion of euros as a target, and now is over a 9 billion project. The project is being drafted and the proof of concept is being studied. Now, the finance team will involve the European Union, the European Investment Bank, public and private capital. The aims are two. The first one, is to renew with green, as we say. The magic word today, I think, is green and technology. We have then to make a, a big renew with the, the keyword green to the coastal fleet, not only referring to the big passenger uh, boats, but also to the small ferry boats and the small daily crafts. It is worth to mention that coastal ferries, small or big, connect 116 habitable islands where nearly 15 percent of the greek population belongs to them the second day apart from the new of the greek coastal fleet of course is to together with the cooperation and assistance of the greek government the greek shipyards and the greek members of the maritime cluster to assist the economy how we have to absorb as much as possible of the funds in order to get in to the Greek industry. And hopefully, why not? The majority of the funds will be absorbed by the Greek state and the Greek maritime cluster. So what we what we, we think, what we aim is a win-win project for public transport, the island economies, the cohesion of the country, the environment, shipyards, manufacturers, and maritime service providers. Let's hope that uh, we shall achieve the sequence of excellence. Excuse me, because I had a small problem with the internet. There, there is an internet problem in the area, uh, as far from what I learned. I hope that uh, you are listening to me. Uh, I would like now to pass to Mr. Dimitris, to Dimitris Fofalios, and ask him, 2020 was a year that we all remember for various reasons. What was the impact of the pandemic in dry bulk sector in 2020, and what are your forecasts for 2021? And I thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. A warm note of thanks to Slide to Open and to Despina Travlou. Um, and I, one thing that the previous panel said about the, uh, the 10 crises, shipping is the management of change and it will always remain uh, that. Uh, shipping has remained flexible and uh, it can adapt. And uh, this is what makes it very special. But bo going back to the dry bulk sector in 2020, it started with three major questions. How would the time chargers and the fuel suppliers respond to IMO 2020 low sulfur fuel regulations? What would be the impact of scrubbers and their installation on the dry bulk fleet? And could the dry bulk fleet uh, could the dry bulk market shake off its traditional first quarter freight rate doldrums? The sector has over 12,000 vessels globally, and it's the world's largest in terms of number of ships, uh, uh, dead weight and dead weight. It also serves the largest number of non-major ports, terminals and anchorages. And this poses unique problems when addressing the aforementioned questions. The first months of 2020 caused significant supply problems for very low sulfur fuel or VLSFO, even in Singapore, the world's largest bunkering hub. And many ships, many bulk ships faced fuel delivery delays. Uh, and many smaller time chargers did not appear to fully understand 
the BIMCO VLSFO clause regarding their obligation to supply the correct fuels to time chartered vessels. The fuel price differential between high sulfur fuel oil and VLSFO was substantial, and this made the scrubber fitted large bulk carriers very attractive to charters. Nevertheless, the first quarter of 2020 served up the usual diet of very low freight rates to add to the owner's list of problems. And in fact, cape sizes actually traded with negative time charter rates in February. By the end of the first quarter, the impact of COVID was beginning to make itself felt to owners, especially for crew changes in Asia. Near the end of first uh, Q1, the Saudi-Russian oil price war erupted, and this was compounded by the drop in oil demand due to COVID, which drove crude prices down almost to zero and the tanker market up with spectacular freight rates. Bunker prices, however, did not dip. The second quarter finally brought some lower bunker prices and a lower uh, price, price spread, which made the, the scrubber fitted bulkers less attractive. COVID was causing uh, owners, especially in the tram bulk sector, uh, to deviate significantly to execute crew changes in ports such as Manila and Reunion. Traditional ports, ports such as Singapore, Hong Kong, all the Chinese ports and many in Asia prohibited, prohibited crew changes. In the third and fourth quarters, more cargo demand from the Far East supported an increase in Panamax, Camsar Max and Supermax handy freight rates with Cape size being very volatile. Uh, throughout the year, and especially from March to December, crew changes and the lack of crew access to shoreside medical facilities became a major concern, as ports worldwide treated seafarers inhumanely. Despite efforts by the shipping industry in declaring seafarers as key workers, governments were far more interested in the bulk ship's cargoes than in the seamen and women trapped on board their vessels some often more than 15 months. So for 2021, crew changes, crew access to medical care and crew vaccination issues will dominate the dry bulk cargo sector. For freight, late, for freight rates, let's hope that the promising start of the year continues to the end and beyond. I could make a prediction using supply and demand figures for 2021, but invariable, invariably an unplanned event will render the forecast inaccurate. So let's hope for a better year than 2020. Thank you. Of course, we hope for it. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's now move to Kostis Fragulis and um, ask him that um, International Propeller Club of the United States of America is one of the oldest networking clubs in shipping worldwide. In which way our branch, International Pro Propeller Club, Port of Piraeus, contributes to the establishment of fruitful collaborations among Greek and American merchant ships? Good evening and thank you, Danae. It's great to be among uh, such a distinguished panel of friends and with you as a moderator. Um, I would like to wish uh, every possible success to the conference. Uh, the Propeller Club of Piraeus uh, was founded in uh, 1935 and is today the oldest active overseas club within the Propeller Network and the oldest uh, business club in Greece in the maritime industry. Among our main goals are the promotion and support of the world mercantile uh, shipping, the promotion of uh, Greek shipping, and of course, the bringing together of uh, US and uh, Greek uh, shipping uh, interests for a mutual benefit. Um, as you personally know very well, we act as a liaison and advisor with uh, the US Embassy on maritime uh, matters, and uh, through our close ties with other organizations in both uh, countries, like the U.S. Coast Guard, the Ministry of uh, Maritime Affairs, the Hellenic Coast Guard, the Hellenic uh, Chamber of Shipping, um, 
the International uh, Propeller Club of uh, the United States, which is um, a very large network with uh, 72 chapters worldwide. Uh, we bring U.S. and uh, Greek shipping closer. To get there, it takes a lot of uh, hard work uh, with trips, visits, meetings, events, seminars and conferences like the hybrid uh, forum we are organizing next May on uh, Greek-US maritime relations. So with various ways, we create a closer bond between Greek and US shipping. Uh, a good example is the collaboration we have with uh, the US Coast Guard, where we cooperate uh, closely in the AMVA program, which is of uh, great importance. And uh, Greece is the number one participant uh, with over 2,000 ships annually. This is a program we have been promoting uh, since 1994 with uh, big success. And it is a great example of uh, an excellent synergy between uh, Greece and the US in the shipping uh, sector through Propeller Club. Uh, so yes, the strengthening of the Greek uh, and US maritime relations is one of our uh, prime uh, missions. We have been uh, committed to this for a very long time, and our aim is to continue working hard uh, towards this uh, important goal and direction. Especially during crisis, uh, bring uh, uh, much bet better, better results. And now I will move to yes. Alex Kadzipateras. Uh, and uh, to discuss about something, I mean, Dimitris Fafalios has already discussed, has already started uh, mentioning how important uh, is the human element and, of course, the problem of the, the crew changes. Neptune Declaration, signed by more than 700 organizations, outlines the main actions that need to be taken to resolve the crew change, uh, changes crisis. Dorian LPG, uh, was one of the first to sign. Can you please share with us uh, its main goal? Thank you, Danai, and uh, thank you, Despina, for having me back and to the whole slide to open team. Absolutely. So, the um, first of all, the declaration is more than a piece of paper. I'd like to say that at the outset. It's not just an agreement that was created to get headlines. As uh, Dimitri said last year, there were some real horror stories. People had 50% of their crew over a contract on their vessels. And especially in certain countries, there were ships stranded outside and still stranded outside for you know over a year, which is really inhumane and hence the human capital aspect of the title of this conference. So at the end of last year, uh, November, December, there was a steering group of companies, including many oil majors, many big cargo traders, who have significantly loud voices worldwide, like Shell, BP, Cargill, Trafigura, who came together and sat at the same table to say, how can we allay people's concerns? How we can, can we you know, reach this goal, which is that seafarers are uh, considered priority workers, essential workers, given priority access to the vaccine, but also allowed to transport freely because they've continued to work throughout last year. Whereas, you know, myself, I've been able to stay at home or, you know, stay inside. So uh, we sat together, we sat around the table virtually, and we put four pillars up there, which was uh, key airline connectivity, which has improved substantially, I'm happy to say. Um, gold standard health protocols. This means uh, testing, basically. It means testing before departure and after arrival, having some sort of quarantine period so that First of all, you know, the ship is like a bubble. You don't want to put someone on the ship and then impact that bubble and then somebody else is at risk, of course. So now we have, let's say, uh, three tests. So you have complete peace of mind that somebody is clear from the infection. And a key, key one was ship owners and charters working together. And we all know that on the spot voyage charters, these no crew change clauses or kicking the can down the road and saying it's not my problem or somebody else owns the cargo, you know, these bad actors will be called out and they'll be called out by name. And I think they realize that. And that's one of the reasons why you have now even 750 
companies signed up to the declaration. Having said all of this, the end goal is for seafarers to be vaccinated. Um, it's going to take time. The latest development as of a week ago is that under the WHO COVAX program, uh, the declaration and the committee members continue to work to look at privately or as an industry body um, acquiring 900,000 to a million doses of the vaccine that could be distributed, uh, let's say, as early as second half this year, I mean, as soon as possible. And um, I think this is really, it, we can't sit still. The situation is better, for sure, uh, but uh, you know, not time to relax yet. Yes, we, uh, we have to honor and to thank all these people that they are now on board because we are now in our houses and uh, having these very important online panels, which is great to bring together all the countries and many different people from all over the world in, in our screens, but we must not forget and we must honor every day, every day. Here in Greece, we honor through Agios Nikolaos. In other, in other places, they may honor with other ways, but we have to honor every day and thank these people for having everything in our houses. So yes, it's very important, it's great to hear these important measures, and of course, we will discuss more later. Semiramis, uh, on the 4th of uh, June, 1982, the Hellenic Marine Environment Protection Association, HELMEPA, is founded. Very important uh, step for, 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 for Greece. 40 years have passed since then, and many achievements have been accomplished. Being the 14th chairperson of HELMEPA, and, uh, and a board of directors that represents the whole spectrum of maritime cluster. What are your next steps? What should we wait for? Thank you, Vanai, and it's uh, my pleasure to be here today. Um, Helmeva, as you said, was founded back in 1982 by a very visionary and forward-looking uh, group of people. They had it identified at the time that the, there was a need to educate uh, and uh, raise awareness on environmental issues uh, for the shipping, uh, for our seafarers and for the Greek uh, shipping community. And um, it was a time when uh, the regulations were still being formulated regarding pollution and environment. Uh, so Helmepa had an important role in educating uh, uh, helping uh, uh, form these regulations and also its mem the, the members were s uh, considered to be to have taken the moral high ground. After that, in 92, uh, Kids uh, Helmepa Junior was created, which uh, mainly uh, made an effort to educate the younger generation. I'm sure you all remember the seagull and its um, adverts on TV about uh, reducing the pollution to our beaches. Uh, today, I think Helmepa is at a similar cross crossroad. We're talking about uh, the implementation of uh, the push by the United Nations uh, of a more sustainable uh, shipping industry. I think uh, we're all uh, trying to figure out what we have to do, where we are, and that's why I think Helmepa has a very important role to play and can be a leader uh, to help uh, the maritime uh, industry adapt to these requirements. The thing is that we need to uh, realize that as a human race, we can't continue to do business and live the same way that we've been doing all these years at the detriment of the future generations. We need to change and we need to do that together collaboratively, collaboratively and in synergies. Uh, and this is what the Helmepa is here to do. It's here to educate and change the culture and the mentality of uh, how we've been thinking so far. It's easy as long as we decide to do it. Uh, and I think that's what COVID has proved to everyone, that there's nothing impossible as long as we all decide to work in the same direction. So basically the three main things that we've been focusing on at the moment is um, mainly making Helmepa more inclusive, attracting more people, attracting the maritime cluster, not only its seafarers and its vessels and the ship managing companies. We've reduced our fees in order to attract the sh all the shipping industry, uh, attract all the ships, and also um, promote uh, the membership of associate members and supporters. Um, 
Another thing that we've decided to do is to uh, attract the younger generation again. Once again, we need to speak their language. We need to use social media. And we need to have the younger generation as our uh, ambassadors. Vanai, is everything okay? Okay. Um, uh, okay, and uh, thirdly, the other thing we need to do is so what we were trying to broaden the seminars. Uh, COVID re made us realize that uh, uh, we can use the digital technology, something that uh, we were all scared to do before, but basically we've managed to reach with our training seminars uh, our seafarers in uh, foreign countries such as uh, Manila and India. We've, we've made our uh, training seminars in English and we're attracting uh, more people, which is uh, very important for us. So what you should be waiting for uh, next? Well, we have a very strong board of directors. Uh, it's inclusive. It has 40% women. It has all ages. And I think uh, we're trying to revitalize Helmepa. We're building on its legacy and on its founder's vision, but we're adapting it to the needs of today. We're listening carefully to what the, the young generation needs. And I think it's the time for Helmepa to shine once again. It's Thank very you. important in that this point, I would like to say that we all remember that for the last 40 years, we're hearing no more plastic in the seas. So yes, maybe now we say plastic free, but uh, Helmepa uh, has taught to us since we were very uh, we were very young that we must take care of our seas and our beaches. So it's very important that you continue this very very important role of Helmepa. And thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to pass to Eleni Polychronopoulou uh, to ask her. We're all aware that Greece is the first ship owning power globally. However. <laughs> great potential ahead for Hellenic Marine Equipment Manufacturers, Hemexpo. How can we achieve to install Greek equipment on board as many vessels, in as many vessels as possible? Thank you, Danai, and thank you, Despina. I wish you success to this very uh, interesting and um, important uh, um, conference. So yes, uh, there are actually um, uh, a lot of uh, changes happening in the Hellenic marine equipment um, environment. Um, over the past years, we have seen a, a very big increase in uh, Greek equipment being installed on board ships, in existing ships, but also in uh, new buildings, but uh, not also only Greek owned, but uh, also internationally owned vessels. And that has been a very, very big uh, success for us. We're very proud of that. So first of all, we are waiting for Mr. Alexandratos to proceed with the project and uh, include all the marine uh, equipment made in Greece in, uh, in the project, of course. But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we as manufacturers, we have an obligation to understand the needs of our customers and what is coming ahead. We need to understand uh, the digitalization um, challenge. We need to understand the decarbonization challenge. And we need to work towards uh, this direction to offer the proper products and be extremely competitive and uh, extremely high level, as is uh, the Greek shipping industry. So uh, in this respect, um, we have already signed agreements with the Space um, Association of Greece and the Association of High Technology Companies of Greece. Uh, we have an MOU in order to uh, benchmark and um, use uh, these uh, high-end technologies in the marine industry because they are already developed in Greece and it's very, very important to pivot them in the, in the shipping industry. And actually, this is the only way we can be competitive. We don't have the heavy industry in Greece. We do not manufacture engines. We do not manufacture diesel generators, but we do manufacture components which are important for uh, for the vessel so um we are uh, we are uh, hoping for uh, the support of uh, the greek state in uh, in our uh, efforts as well as the european union and actually what's happening now on the european uh, level is that uh, there is a great pressure for uh, european marine equipment manufacturers and european shipyards um, to promote the industry in the commission and uh, to be able to have uh, uh, the marine 
equipment and the shipbuilding industry reinstated as a very um, important sector for, uh, for Europe and take measures against uh, what is happening in other parts of the world, which can be very detrimental for the European, uh, for the European economy. So there's a lot of nice things uh, coming um, for the Hellenic marine equipment manufacturers and exporters, and hopefully for, uh, for the shipping industry. We, we want to be close to the shipping industry. We want to be in a constant dialogue with the shipping industry to understand the needs and to be able to offer the correct products. Uh, can, can bring many solutions to many problems and uh, uh, we must all admit that even the European Union is giving a lot of attention to shipping. They have now, they have understood many, uh, some, a few years now that uh, shipping is not only fishery, shipping is the trading, is the 90% of the worldwide trading and Greeks are number one and we're very, very proud to have also Greeks leading important worldwide organizations and like now we have Mr. Fafalios and Peter Cargo. It's very, very important a great honor for this uh, for this country. And now to wrap up, uh, in the last uh, seven, eight minutes that we have I would like to uh, uh, to go back to, to, to George for, for what that Eleni has told about uh, let's, let's sit all together in the table because now I think that the table is bigger and uh, uh, can have all of us. Uh, so, what you, are, you 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 could say about maritime alas and what Eleni is suggesting to be all together? Thanks again. I'll try to be very short as much as possible uh, for the for the next one two minutes. I have to tell that uh, it's it's by all means all all today panelists. Uh, uh, I, independently of what uh, they were the cons of the speech, there was one common word for everybody, which was synergy. So as a, let me allow an expression in Greek, to kapelaksu ke mono sou finito, for me. For me today is joint growth. For me today is to have a, a same aims, to, to have, a, to, to understand, and make a correct synergies, efficient synergies, and the maritime alas, at least, the three main organizations, the Union of Greek Ship Owners, EVEP, and the Hellenic Chamber of Shipping, finally reached an agreement and created the Maritime Alliance. If the Maritime Alliance, at the end of the day, will succeed or not, it does not depend by the three unions, it depends by all of us, if we believe all of us in one to the other. I have, I'm a bit upset, and I made a, a note down here to compare what's happening to other countries. Just have only one thing in our mind. Okay, okay, Greece today owns close to 22% of the world fleet. We are number one. And we owe more than 50% from the European fleet, own fleet. Okay, what is now, what we're taking? So this country now tries and to, to develop the maritime cluster. And who, who disputes? that this maritime class will be useful for all of us here. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you just a small in order to conclude very shortly. What's happening now, for example, there are maritime clusters, UK, Norway, Denmark, Italy, Singapore, but just compare the fleet, the percentage that they have, okay? And I will tell you for, in UK, for example, the pure shipping activities contributed to, G to the GVA in 2019, I have the last data, about 15 billion billion, while the total direct contribution of the maritime sector was about 47 billion. The indirect was 39 billion, I'm speaking for British pounds, and the induced 22.6 billion. Total, 110 billion. Unfortunately, as I told you, this is not the case in our country. So, to conclude, and uh, leave also to, to hear time to hear the, the useful uh, positions of the other co-panelists. I, I think that we need now to join forces to, uh, to assist any campaigns for the international maritime community to familiarize with the Greek maritime industry services, learn, learn what's happening in the cargo, let's what's happening in propeller, let's what's happening in Hemexpo, in Helmepa, in the Dorian shipping company, for you and I, that you are the co-founder of the Yes Forum that promotes the, the, the shipping to the next generation. Let's assist each other and let's focus and aim 
that the new opportunities will be the accomplishment of our vision to steer the non-shipping members of the cluster to a wider horizon. Many congratulations. Thank you very much for being one of the panelists today. We are always managing to wrap up everything because we have only one minute to say to say goodbye. So Dimitri Kosti, Alex, Alex Miramis, and Ellen and Eleni, can I have one last uh, word? Uh, what? Uh, how to close this very uh, very nice bl first blue day because it is a blue day and our discussion. Uh, uh, Dimitri, what we take from uh, uh, from you a positive message to wrap up? Well, the, the, the positive is that um, we are making uh, progress on the crew changes, like uh, Alex uh, very uh, said. Uh, we still need to work harder. Unfortunately, uh, despite efforts of everybody, including uh, the Neptune Declaration members, we still uh, our seafarers are still not key workers in practice. And uh, this has brought us a big problem that our maritime sphere of influence uh, has turned out to be ineffective in this crisis. And the only way we're going to solve this, I'm sorry to say, is by a group of prime ministers and presidents getting together. No, uh, we have tried everything. Unfortunately, um, it's, it's, it has to be solved at an incredibly high level and the, and the marine industry is usually an industry of actions, a lot of actions and very few words. Uh, this time we're going to have to go really, really very, very high to solve the crew change uh, crisis because I'm sure that the, uh, the, the, uh, we have failed our crew uh, in certain situations, but we must never give up. And that's what we have to do. Stick together and never give up. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Kosti. Uh, very briefly, I would like to say that I'm very optimistic about the future of Greek shipping. And um, also, I, I believe that we are uh, very close in seeing a revival in uh, the shipyard business in Greece. Uh, we saw some uh, important uh, U.S. investments happening uh, the last uh, two years, which uh, will continue happening uh, in the next years. And um, we, we are happy to always to see the Greek ship owning uh, uh, market being number one in the world. But I, I believe that we can also see the shipping industry, the uh, the shipyards, the ship repairing, the ship building, evolving, progressing, and happening because it's something that has to happen uh, in Greece. Uh, we cannot not we cannot only be number one uh, as ship owners. We can also have a full uh, sh uh, shipping industry in this country, and I'm very optimistic about uh, this, and I, I see this happening. All together, more shipyards. Alex, vaccine, a lot of vaccinations. Many. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I think that the vaccine is the ultimate uh, solution. I mean, hopefully the prime ministers come together, but I think the vaccine might happen before then. And I think it's all about education, because as you see with AstraZeneca today, there's a lot of fear mongering going around. So I think we have to educate people about the safety of the vaccines. And, and that's my kind of sum summary. Very right. Samira Miss? Uh, yes, Sanaya, I think you were right. Uh, Helmepa has been uh, promoting sustainability well before the actual phrase sustainability development was uh, introduced by the United Nations. I, I strongly believe that Helmepa is a platform for the shipping cluster to develop and to reach their uh, uh, development goals. We are here to help you. Uh, we see this as a partnership because if we want to do things and change them, we need to work together. We mentioned that before. And uh, we welcome everyone uh, in uh, Helmepa and have a look at our website. And uh, I might be making a few calls uh, to our panelists, asking them to and support they, Helmepa. <laughs> very important. And last but not least, Eleni, once there is a will, there is a way. We can make it happen. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Semiramis, we are already members. So you will not be calling me, I know. So, but it's, it would be a good idea to make him expo a member, by the way. 
So, George, uh, I just want to tell you that uh, the marine equipment in Greece is, uh, has a contribution of uh, 350 million for uh, 2020. And uh, with a multiplier of 1.7, we have a, a very, very strong um, presence now uh, in the industry. But our goal is to go to 1.5 billion. So we are ready to work together to make uh, cost-efficient products, energy-efficient products, innovative uh, products for uh, the Greek uh, shipping industry, but uh, the international shipping industry as well. Many, many thanks to all of you. George, Dimitri, Kosti, Alex, Semiramis, Eleni. A big thanks from my heart. A big thanks to Slide to Open for being all together uh, today at this important discussion. See you all soon. I hope... I hope face to face. Let's let's make it happen too. <laughs> Goodbye. Good night to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are for the wrap up of our first day. Thank you for joining us for this conference. When I first uh, got engaged in the wonderful world of ship finance, I was advised that two matters were of most importance. One was deep pockets, and the other was a reputation. And indeed, there is an amazing amount of truth in this, which still holds very much at heart and is the crux of success in shipping. But some 25 years onwards, there is much more to shipping than there used to be. And this is what the first day of this conference has, hopefully, managed to carry forward to you as a message. The various modules, discussions and presentations have had as their aim to stress the multifaceted nature of shipping. Without adequately trained people, we cannot operate assets. And without financing, we cannot have sustainable assets engaged in sustainable trading. Not to mention the need to have the people and these assets communicate effectively between them. We hope you have enjoyed this first day of our conference, which actually has seen positive and promising soundings from our participants. So let's be on tomorrow for our second day with a focus on yellow innovation. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.